We're here today to hear about the life and career of David R. Hansen, who is a non-active judge on the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Hansen served as a judge and a chief judge and a senior judge for the Eighth Circuit during his active service, which lasted from 1991 to 2011. He also had a brilliant career as a lawyer and a district court judge, a district court judge on the federal bench and on the Iowa state court bench. Judge Hansen was a distinguished lawyer, which we'll also hear about. And with all that said, Judge Hansen, thank you for being here this afternoon. With I'm happy to be here, Thad. Judge Hansen, you were born in Exira, Iowa, out in the rolling western hills, Danish Iowa, maybe, and you uh, spent most of your life in nearby Atlantic. Uh, what would you like to share with us about those early years of your life? Well, you're right. That is Danish America out there. In the communities of Elkhorn and Kemmelton and <clears throat> Brayton and Exira are, are big Danish communities. And I grew up, I'm a, I'm a hundred percent Dane, and grew up under the influence of hardworking, frugal, uh, moderate people, and uh, enjoyed it very much. My grandfather on my mother's side organized the first lumber yard in Brayton, Iowa, and uh, uh, I spent my summers there as a, as a kid growing up. Uh, and grew up swinging a hammer, so I, uh, I have carpentry as a, one of my hobbies. Were there particular events or circumstances that shaped your young life? Uh, I, I can't recall any particular one. I, <clears throat> uh, we had a neighbor in Atlantic whose name was Roscoe Jones. He was a trial lawyer of, of uh, no small ability. And uh, he sort of took me under his wing and and brought me along and interested me in government and in, and in politics in general. So he was, a, he was maybe the first one that got you on the path to the law and, and in the stellar career ahead. He, he, certainly, he certainly was. Okay, uh, were there any other major figures in shaping your worldview at the time, either around there or, or you know, historical figures of any note? Uh, my, my, uh, my uncle had a very significant influence on me. His name was, uh, his given name was Ormo, O-R-M-O, uh, Rasmussen, but everybody called him Boots. And uh, he, uh, he was one of the uh, people of the early, th early 20th century for whom the sky was the limit. You could do everything that you set your mind to do, and you always should do the very best that you can do. And those... Uh, those ideas and concepts uh, helped form me. Wonderful. Were there any lawyers or any legal tie-ins in your family? No, there were, there were no, no legal tie-ins at all in my family. My sole connection to the law was Mr. Jones. Wonderful. So where did you graduate high school? Atlantic, class of 1956. Remember the size of that class? Uh, 107, if I remember right. Now that was a pretty good sized class for that time period, right? Well, Atlantic sits uh, very strategically. It's 50 miles from Council Bluffs and uh, 60 miles from Des Moines, and uh, it's 50 miles from Carroll, and uh, the only big town south of us was uh, Clorinda. So, so regional center type of thing? It was. A very big shopping center. So where did life take you after graduation? Well, I uh, matriculated to Northwest, what was then Northwest Missouri State College in Maryville, Missouri uh, for my undergraduate work. Now that's an out-of-state school from, uh, from the thinking of an Iowan. Uh, what, what took you to an out-of-state school? Finances. I could, uh, I could attend... Uh, uh, Northwest uh, for half of what it would cost me uh, to go to the University of Iowa. And th there were a lot of uh, Southwest Iowa students like me who did that. And we, we called it the University of Southwest Iowa, but uh, they insisted that it was Northwest Missouri State College. Now, my father always used to speak fondly of those schools. He was on the dental admissions committee for several years as the best values in education. And he said there were a lot of Iowans that went down there from the southern part of the state, but he even encouraged from people around our part of the state to look into it for that very reason. I think it continues to be like that to this day. It does. When, when I attended there, it had an enrollment of about 900 students. And most recently, I think it's up around 7,000. Did it get renamed? Uh, do you know? If Not yet. 
uh, Missouri established teacher training institutions in the four corners of the state and in the central part of the state. The other, uh, the other schools have uh, renamed themselves. What was Northeast Missouri State is now Truman State, and uh, what was Southwest is now Missouri State College. Okay, now you said Marysville. How far would that be from Atlantic? It's, it's Maryville. Maryville, okay. 90 miles. So much closer than even Iowa State would be to Atlantic. You bet. All right. So what did you study at Northwest? Well, <clears throat> I, am, I majored in uh, history, in economics, and in social science. I took a, a, a plan from, the, from my freshman year to, to do a triple major. Uh, why did you pick a triple major, or what went into that thinking? Well, my thinking was uh, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer at that time, principally because of the influence of Mr. Jones. But uh, I wanted to be as broadly prepared for that as I, as I could be, and the electives in, in each major sort of dovetailed, and so I could do it with, with some planning. I understand you did it pretty well, too. You graduated with honors? Uh, with highest honors. With highest honors. Uh, now, I, I guess my next question is, did you have any time to do anything else other than a triple major where you graduate with highest honors? Yes, I did. I was a member of Talk Kappa Epsilon fraternity, was president of my house, and uh, I helped found the College Young Republicans Club. Wonderful. Okay, what year did you graduate from Northwest? 1960. What was next for you? Well, I, I uh, went east to Washington and enrolled in George Washington University uh, Law School. Was that the only reason you went, is for law school? No, I had, uh, it's kind of a, a, a bit of a long story. My grandfather had <clears throat> been one of five men who uh, helped stake uh, Ben F. Jensen to his first political campaign in 1938. And he was elected to the House and was re-elected for 26 years. Um, I had served as a, as a page in the Iowa legislature, and I wanted to be a page in the national legislature. And so he, he uh, managed to uh, get me an appointment as a page in 1956. And he knew I wanted to go to law school. Uh, so Christmas Eve of my uh, senior year in college, he had a letter hand-delivered to my home telling me that if I wanted to, I could come to Washington, work for him, and uh, attend uh, law school whenever I could get a law course. And so I took him up on it. That's pretty good constituent outreach there, I would think, huh? Uh, so what were your job duties with Mr. Jensen? Well, uh, the first, uh, he was a very senior Republican on the House Appropriations Committee, and so I went to work uh, on that committee staff, the minority staff of House Appropriations for 18 months, <clears throat> and then his uh, administrative assistant left for other employment, and I moved over to his congressional office and, and worked there. I worked in the 60 campaign and in the 62 campaign for him. Mrs. Hanson was also telling me that over lunch today that you, uh, you did whatever walked in the door, tours, the whole nine yards. That's right, that's right. Okay, uh, you were then going to night school at GW. We called it the evening division. The evening division. And right. uh, I, I went, uh, I took a couple classes uh, during the summer uh, in, in the day, on the day side. But the evening division was populated by more mature people. We had uh, quite a number of military officers, majors, uh, lieutenant commanders in the Navy. Uh, who were uh, augmenting their resumes, and uh, some businessmen who wanted the, the uh, a legal education. And so the maturity level was considerably higher in the evening division than it was in the, uh, day, on the day side. What about workload? Did it, was it a three-year program where they tried to stick it in uh, those divisions, or did you have to supplement it with some other times? Or? No, normally it was, uh, the evening division was a four-year plan. Uh, I was fortunate to have had a, st a student deferment all the way through undergraduate school. These were the days of mandatory military obligation. And uh, when I wanted to go to law school, I was only going to be going part-time in the evening. And I went to my draft board and asked them that if I accumulated the same number of credit hours 
going the calendar around, including summer school, as, a, <clears throat> as an ordinary full-time student would in two semesters, would they continue my deferment? And I pledged to them that if they would do that when I finished law, law school, then I would, I would serve my military obligation. I'd either enlist or I'd, I'd take a commission or I'd, I'd, I'd do my duty. And they said that was fine with them, so they continued my deferment all the way through law school. Now, did they uh, have you sign up for anything and say, well, let's get that in writing so when you're out on the backside, we've got you? No, they did not. It was a handshake deal. All right, so you, what, what year did you say you finished law school? 1963. 1963. I did the, I did the normal four-year <clears throat> four uh, curriculum in, in a little less than three years. So where'd you go then? Well, consistent with my pledge, I uh, contacted the uh, Judge Advocate General's Corps of the Army and uh, offered to join that organization, and, and uh, they were kind enough to, to let me do that. They did insist on a four-year commitment, uh, and that was fine with me. I was single, unattached. So did they send you out right away? You enlisted and you were out the door the next day, or did you do something in the no, meantime? There was, a, there was a time between my graduation and uh, my orders for active duty of about four months when I uh, was an associate with uh, Mr. Jones's law firm, which was then called Jones, Cambridge, and Carl, and today it's known as the Cambridge firm. Now, did you take a bar exam in that period of time? I did. I came, I came back to Iowa and took the Iowa Bar in October of 63. No, you took the Iowa Bar, you worked in that firm. Was it your long-term plan to be in Iowa, or did you just say, well, that's the one right in front of me right now, and we'll go for it? No, my long-term plan, I think, was to come back to Iowa uh, eventually. Well, whether it would be with that firm or not, I didn't, I didn't know. Where did your military orders take you first? Uh, they first took me to uh, the Armor Officer Basic Course at Fort Knox, Kentucky. In those years, all the JAG officers had to be combat arms qualified. And they, <clears throat> so they sent a third of us to the infantry school at Fort Benning, a third of us to the armor school at Fort Knox, and a third to the, in to the artillery school at Fort Sill. And our primary uh, military occupational specialty was as a JAG officer. But if you flip the, MSO, the MOS card on the backside, you were uh, uh, qualified as an infantry platoon leader or an armor platoon leader or an artillery platoon leader. So in case they needed some extra bodies at the front, uh, you know, That's right. you, you, you were aware of that and knew what you would be doing. That's, well, I wouldn't say that, but, uh, <laughs> but I knew that was a, a potential. Okay, so you went to Fort Knox, Kentucky, and that was a training spot. Then were, were you assigned somewhere from there? No, the Army <clears throat> at that time maintained a, a Judge Advocate General School at the University of Virginia's Law School. And so they sent all of us there uh, for nine weeks of military law. Uh, it was, we used the facilities of the University of Virginia for that purpose. The Army now has its own uh, Judge Advocate General School out north of Charlottesville in, in its own building. So you finished nine months there. They say now you're a JAG officer and you can go out and... Uh, nine weeks, yeah. Nine weeks. So where, where did you go then? I was assigned to the 2nd Infantry Division at Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay. Uh, what were your daily duties as a JAG officer? Well, <clears throat> I was uh, designated the legal assistance officer for that division which meant any soldier with a legal problem was entitled to uh, free legal advice and they would come in and pose their problems and we would try to help solve them. Uh, I also served as a, a trial counsel for general court martials. Uh, we served six months on the prosecution side and six months on the defense side. Now was that mandatory or something you volunteered for? It was mandatory. All right. So with that, when you talk to a young service person, it sounds like you didn't know what to expect. Whatever they came in with uh, as a question, you were their lawyer. That's, that's right. And, and uh, they could have come from any of the 48 states or the territories, or 50 states in the territories. 
All right. How would you describe that experience for a young lawyer? It sounds a little daunting uh, in a way. It, it was. Uh, when I heard boots in the hallway, I, I was a little scared, but uh, uh, it was amazing to me the consistency among some, uh, most of the states in the way they approached uh, consumer problems, for instance. And uh, with the help of uh, Martindale Hubble's summary of the law of each state, why well, I was able to give the some advice. Sounds like pretty good preparation for the future then too. I thought it was. Okay, you have one particular experience as a JAG officer I'd like to highlight as something that was a really big part of U.S. history, but before I do that, is there anything you'd like to highlight? No, I, my Army experience was uh, an amazing one. I was, uh, I was very pleased with my duty assignments with the people that I worked with and for, and uh, thought about making it a career and then decided against it. Now the particular one I want to direct your attention to is something I've understood called the Alabama Campaign of 1965. Uh, yes. Would you like to tell us about that? Well, <clears throat> the 2nd Infantry Division at Fort Benning uh, was known in the South as the 2nd uh, Integration Division because it got the mission it first had the mission to put James Meredith uh, into the law school at the University of Mississippi in 1962. And uh, when then Dr. King decided that he would lead a march from Selma to Montgomery, uh, the, the governor of, of uh, Alabama, Mr. Wallace, informed the president that he, his, uh, his state police, his highway patrol and the like, could not guarantee the safety of the marchers and asked the president for help, and the, the army then uh, said they would, and they uh, put two regular MP battalions, about 800 military policemen each, and a headquarters outfit from, uh, from my division, and we all assembled in, <coughs> in Montgomery uh, to provide protection for the marchers. Now, did you just get that assignment in the normal course then because you're with the uh, Second Infantry or was it something you said, okay, I want to volunteer for this or get involved somehow? Well, I, I volunteered and I also was selected uh, by the Staff Judge Advocate, Colonel Young, to, uh, to pull that duty. Bit of an honor, I would think, because that's one of those uh, tough duties that they would give to somebody they thought was up to the task. Well... I, I, I learned a lot and uh, enjoyed it. I know you're a humble man, but we'll just leave it with my statement there as not being rebutted, because I think it's, a, it's quite an honor. Well, it, it, it is, there is an interesting side note to that. Um, the Department of the Army headquarters sent down a major JAG officer uh, to uh, advise as well. His name was Emery Sneeden. And he had recruited me out of George Washington's uh, law class for the JAG Corps, so we knew each other ahead of time. Uh, he stayed in the JAG Corps, eventually wore a star as a Brigadier General, retired, and was appointed as a United States Circuit Judge for the Fourth Circuit. And so the, the two Army lawyers who were at Selma in 1965 both ended up as United States Circuit Judges. So did you have occasions to uh, see Judge Sneeden on a professional level? I did not. Uh, he died, uh, uh, sadly, uh, before I was appointed a circuit judge. That's very interesting. Now, you've given us a little bit of the background and history and set the stage for us. Can you tell us a little bit more particularly what that entailed for you when you got there? Who was there? Who were you dealing with? How the things went day to day? Well, I was part of a brigade headquarters that came over from Fort Benning. And the brigade had been out on a field training exercise about a week long, and they were all dog tired. And so when we got to uh, Montgomery, to the uh, uh, Air Force Base there, uh, why it was about 10.30 at night, and somebody had to be the duty officer that night, and I'd had a good night's sleep the night before, so I volunteered, and and the brigadier who was in command of the operation uh, uh, graciously accepted my offer and it made me the duty officer for that night. That was also my introduction to uh, 
what at the time in 1965 was truly extraordinary communication ability. About 2.30 in the morning, a, a man in civilian clothes carrying an aluminum suitcase came in, uh, presented credentials identifying himself as a Chief Warrant Officer W-4 from the uh, White House Communication Office. And he wondered if he could have a desk, and certainly. So he, we put him up at a, at a desk, and he got out his suitcase, ran up a little antenna, and had instant communication with the White House Situation Room. Oh, my goodness. That was an eye-opener for me. Yeah, I probably th they would think you would think, wow, I'm, I'm into something big here. <laughs> so what were your legal duties? They had you there as a JAG officer. What were you doing? Well, uh, I, I gave advice to the commander, and uh, uh, he didn't ask for very much, uh, but uh, he, was, uh, he was a brigadier general, and uh, was a well-educated man and uh, had his mission from the president as to what he should do, and he went about it. Uh, uh, I also did some other administrative duties. I was uh, sometimes in a helicopter flying the route of march uh, between Selma and Montgomery <clears throat> and uh, reporting back as to what I saw. Now, as, as I remember that, and correct me if I'm wrong, there were, you know, judicial decisions being issued. It was kind of hot off the presses at some points in time. And did you have to get involved in uh, sort of interpreting the latest and the greatest right there on the ground? Uh, not, not to a great extent. Uh, we were there to enforce uh, a federal district judge's order, Judge Frank Johnson of, of the District of Northern Alabama, or pardon me, Southern Alabama, and uh, he, he had written a very clear opinion as to uh, what he expected uh, in the way of what the rights of the marchers were. And so uh, his order was a blueprint for the operation. Did you meet with any of the uh, historical figures we know on a regular basis or at all, like Dr. King or representatives from his staff? Did you have an interface with them? Uh, no, I was in the same room with some of them, but uh, never, uh, never engaged them in any conversation. So you were sort of present if needed, uh, if, uh, needed right. if they needed to say, we'd like to talk to our counsel, you were there. <laughs> so would that group have included Dr. King at the time? It was, it did, uh, and uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson as well. Okay, um, did you have any contact from your side with other people that we might not otherwise know about? We heard about the White House having a piece involved, we've got the military involved. Was there like a press corps component of this that was... I, I didn't interact with the press at all. You kept them away actually probably from what you were doing, huh? All right, now that march has gone down in history is a, is a big moment in the United States history and, and truly a successful moment for the march and for the protection. You ever have any private moments where you like to reflect back on that and take a little satisfaction in the job well done? Oh, I, I, I feel fortunate that, that uh, none of the marchers <clears throat> suffered any. We had no fatalities until the march was over. And when the march was over, <clears throat> a woman from Detroit was murdered by the Klan. Her name, if I remember right, was Louiso, and uh, that uh, lengthened our stay at, uh, at at Montgomery. So you kept the, the, with the Second Infantry, then just stayed on there. We 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 stayed a couple extra days to assist other law enforcement agencies. All right, now that, that point in our history has always fascinated me, where we had the military out enforcing court orders, um, and I would think for a young lawyer that would have been pretty heavy and heady stuff. Do you have any, any thoughts maybe in retrospect on that? No, not, not really. It was, uh, it was duty. It was what, what you were uh, ordered to do. Anything in particular you took away from the Alabama experience professionally that maybe you used later in your practice or something, to, a life lesson, practice lesson type of thing? Oh, I think it, I think it drove home to me that you're going to get all kinds of clients, and you had all kinds of clients in the military practice as well. When the uh, whole operation was over, the commanding general uh, had a party at the officers club at, at Fort Benning, and 
passed out uh, military police batons, uh, nightsticks, and he had them painted up with the Alabama campaign on them and gave them to the officers who had been with him uh, on that march, and I was the most junior officer to receive one. And you kept that uh, displayed in your chambers, as I recall. I did. I used it on law clerks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I took notice of that right away. I said, boy, I better make, uh, make sure I do a good job here. Um, now, in addition to the souvenir you took from the, uh, the commander and your professional experience, you also got something else out of the Alabama experience, did you not? I did. I, I met um, uh, my wife, uh, uh, Mary Virginia Lee, uh, who's better known as Ginger Lee, uh, on a blind date in, in Alabama. She was a school teacher in Columbus, Georgia at the time. So the blind date was just set up by somebody with a... Set up by a, a fellow officer. Uh, now, we could say the rest is history, but did, uh, did you guys get married in short order? I know so, some of us that are a uh, generation behind think, boy, some of those marriages happened fairly quickly. At that time, people knew well, what they wanted to do. We, we dated for about 13 months. and, and In fact, we met in January of 1965 and married in February of 1966. Were you still in Alabama that whole time, or did you go somewhere else? Yes, I was still in Alabama. At that, well... Yeah, all the time we were courting, I was in Alabama, but I received orders uh, to serve as the post-judge advocate at Fort Monroe, Virginia, where I had a three-lawyer office that I maintained. Okay, when you say post-judge advocate, that was a, a supervisor of sorts, right? Well, no, uh, Fort, Mon Fort Monroe was the home of the uh, Continental Army Command, uh, commanded by a four-star general. And of course, it needs a it needs a place to live, and so that was the post, P O S T, and uh, we provided all the customary services for uh, for a headquarters operation, and that included uh, having a staff judge advocate. So, what year was that? You recall? 1960, uh, mid June, mid July, 65 was when I was assigned there. Okay, it was uh, uh, Mary Virginia Lee, Mrs. Hanson then? Or no, we, we didn't marry until early the next year. Okay, so you did the uh, a little bit of a distance thing for a while, mm -hmm. uh, married, and then where where did you begin your married life? I brought her back to Fort Monroe because I had uh, uh, two years yet to serve. Did you serve it all out at Fort Monroe? I did. And then what did you do when that time ended? Well, uh, I, I knew I wanted to practice law. I, I wasn't sure where. Uh, during my military legal experience, I had done quite a bit of government procurement work. And uh, I was willing to sell that experience uh, on the other side of the table. And so I... Uh, uh, applied with various uh, large government contractors and interviewed with several and uh, also uh, uh, I ended up uh, in, in general practice in Iowa Falls, Hardin County, Iowa. Now how'd that come to be and then and if you wouldn't mind would you comment on did Mr. Jones play a part in that equation or? No, he, well he, I had an offer from his firm that, that I declined uh, but I'd kept up my Iowa Bar membership and the Iowa Bar News wasn't the slick magazine we know today. It was a uh, kind of a newsletter, eight, maybe eight pages. And there was a <clears throat> classified section at the back, and there was a blind ad, a practitioner in a north central Iowa town desires an associate. If uh, interested, send resume to a blind box in Des Moines. I had a stack of resumes and postage was six cents, and so I sent one off. I got back a six-page letter from Don W. Barker, a practicing lawyer in Iowa Falls, telling me all about his practice in the town and the, the clients and the like. And uh, Ginger and I were coming out to Iowa anyway to interview with what was then, I think, Iowa Power and Light. And uh, so we just stayed an extra day and drove up to Iowa Falls to see Mr. Barker and his practice. 
So what did Mrs. Hansen think when you uh, sprung that on her that you're going to go to Iowa Falls and talk to this gentleman? He, he, she's married a guy who's just been involved in the big civil rights march and been in D.C. and been in all these places, and here we're going to the middle of uh, farm country, essentially. That's right, but she grew up in an agricultural community. Her father was an international harvester dealer for many years. Uh, so she was familiar with agriculture, although on a much smaller scale than what we practice here. Uh, but she was very willing to, to look at the uh, opportunity, and uh, she, she liked the town very much when we were shown around by Mrs. Barker. Okay, we, we, it was a joint decision to land in Iowa Falls. We spent New Year's Eve that, that, uh, that winter uh, at a party over in the corner trying to decide what we were going to do with the rest of our lives because I had told Mr. Barker that I was going to make my mind up on uh, New Year's Day. <laughs> a little pressure as time was ticking towards midnight. That's right. Well, it sounded like it worked out pretty well. Um, did. Now, for Mrs. Hansen, uh, life in Iowa Falls, she's from a different part of the country. How did that go, settling into the community and community life for her? Well, I did have to send her back to Alabama about every six months to renew her accent, but she, she taught school uh, in Iowa, enjoyed the kids, enjoyed the farm community. She's, she's well adapted to Iowa. Wonderful. Now this law firm you joined, Mr. Barker had a pretty good practice as I understand it, um, but it was, it was different than what you had done. I mean, uh, can you kind of tell me in what ways it was different and maybe what ways it was similar to what you had done? Well, <clears throat> he, he did uh, very little criminal defense work. Uh, he was very heavy into uh, real estate transactions, uh, forming corporations. Uh, a very heavy probate practice. He probably had oh, anywhere from 40 to 50 estates open at any one time. Uh, and he was very busy. He just had more work than he could do. And so I started doing just a general practice. We did anything that came in the door that we thought we could handle. If we had to try a case, we tried a case. If we settled them, we settled them. Now I'm thinking in my mind, sounds a little bit like when the soldier comes walking in the door and says, I've got a problem, you handle whatever comes in then. It, it, there were similarities. Yeah. Um, well, tell us a little bit about what a small town practitioner was doing in that period of time. What the day-to-day -day diet, I mean, I'm sure being a general practitioner is no day-to-day -day diet, but there is sort of a general overall mix. Uh, <clears throat> well, you, you had your appointments uh, of clients who had called to make an appointment. You had the walk-ins who came in. Uh, you had uh, the community organizations that you belonged to, the Rotary Club. Uh, the, uh, there was an, uh, an organization called Off the Record Club in Hardin County where we invited uh, notable people to come and speak off the record uh, about, their, uh, about their work. Uh, there was uh, the Chamber of Commerce, of course, and uh, various church organizations. So it was a very busy time, and your, you know, your your clients became your friends, and your friends hopefully became your clients. It, it, that sounds like one of the things I'm going to be asked about. But highlights of your small town practice. What are the things you fondly remember about small town practice? The the opportunity to help people and and to be. Uh, the catalyst for the resolution of disputes and, and arguments between folks who both are well-meaning. Now, I know some of the practice stories you've told over the years. I'll just ask you if you'd share a few of your favorite stories with us, and I might throw a one or two out there to pique your interest. Well, one that, one that sticks in my mind is I have... Uh, the Rock Island Railroad main line uh, from Kansas City to Minneapolis came through Iowa Falls. And I had a client living south of town who uh, had a herd of stock cows. And the law in Iowa at the time was that it was the railroad's responsibility to fence the railroad right away. And it wasn't the landowner's responsibility. And so if your cattle got out on the railroad right away, it was the railroad's fault for a negligent fence. 
And my client had had some cattle get out on the railroad right of way and were killed by an oncoming freight train. And so I filed a claim with the Rock Island and they sent an adjuster around to see me about it. And I invited him into my office and I was telling him about my client's loss and, and what, what uh, good cattle these were. And he let me go on for a while and he held his hand up and he said, uh, Mr. Hanson, he says, I've been adjusting claims for the Rock Island Railroad for 30 years. And I'm here to tell you, sir, that the Rock Island Railroad kills nothing except purebred stock. <laughs> that just shut me up. I, I couldn't think of anything else to say. That was pretty good. Now, it, it, I'll throw another one out there that, uh, that I liked in particular as a young lawyer when you told me about a client who called in the, the wee hours of the morning and said the car had been stolen. Right. And, yeah. and you, you pointed out that you got to do what you got to do as a small town practitioner. It was about 1 a.m. and uh, my client, uh, who was a substantial client of the firm's, uh, called me and he said, uh, my car is stolen. He said, uh, it isn't where I left it, I can't find it. I want you to come down and see what you can do. So I got out of bed and went, went down, and as I was, I, I said, where are you? And he said, I'm at the Elks Club. Well, I sort of figured I knew what was the problem was. And uh, so I went into town. We were living out uh, on an acreage at that time. And went into town, and uh, I saw his car uh, parked in front of another drinking establishment. Uh, where I supposed that he had left it uh, when the evening began. And uh, I located him in the Elks Club, and I said, I found your car. He said, you did? Where would you find it? I said, I think I found it where you left it. And I told him where I'd found it. He said, oh, that's right. That's where I left it. So I took him home and uh, dropped him off, and uh, I sent him a bill for my services the next morning computed on an hourly basis, and uh, he paid it without question. <laughs> and maybe never mention it again, huh? <laughs> that's, uh, that's full service practitioner life though, right? Um, I, my guess is he probably continued to be a client. He did. Yeah, wonderful. Now I know we can tell war stories all day and whatnot, and we want to move through this. Anything, anything else you want to highlight as a, as a good, particularly good story from the practice? I, I don't think so. All right. Now you had many memorable cases and some real notable ones, and I want to just like the JAG experience. There's one I want to cover in particular, and that's the line item veto case. That's the way I describe it. Are there any you want to cover before that? Uh, no, no. Well, let's talk about that line item veto case. If you can just tell me about the case, how it came to be, and what it involved. Well, in 1968, uh, the Iowa populace adopted an amendment to the Iowa Constitution which uh, gave the governor uh, the power to uh, veto a line item from an appropriation bill. And uh, this is 1973 when this thing arises. We had a, a, a client of our firm, a regular client, a good client, whose name was Richard Weldon. And Dick was also a state representative uh, serving on the House Appropriations Committee. And he was very upset by Governor Ray's exercise of the item veto power against appropriation bills that he had helped author. And he brought uh, the bills in to me and, uh, and inquired as to whether or not the governor had acted in accordance with the uh, item veto power amendment to the Constitution. I took a look at what Governor Ray had done and decided that I didn't think he had acted in accordance with the Constitution and advised my client accordingly. He then uh, found uh, 25 other members of the Iowa legislature who felt the same way he did about the governor's uh, exercise and uh, they hired me to file suit to contest the uh, item vetoes that the governor had had exercised. And so uh, uh, we, we filed that case uh, in Polk County District Court. We lost it in the trial court. Uh, the Honorable Gibson C. Holliday, Chief Judge, 
and uh, appealed to the uh, Iowa Supreme Court, which, uh, affer uh, which uh, reversed the district court and uh, said that the governor, governor had, in fact, acted unconstitutionally. Uh, and that vote was 72. I, uh, we argued that case uh, on a day in January in 75. And uh, I looked up at the bench in the Iowa Supreme Court and I only had eight justices. The chief justice wasn't there. And uh, I said a silent prayer, please don't let them split four or four because that would affirm the trial court. And uh, then it's, my mind kicked in and I remembered that the chief justice was over at Vets Auditorium swearing in the governor to another term. And uh, the courtroom was, was full of, of uh, legislators and other people interested in the issue. And uh, we argued the case and uh, we got a decision in May uh, written by Justice Harvey Uhlenhoff that uh, reversed the trial court. And the Chief Justice participated in the decision? He, he did. I, after I was appointed a, an Iowa district judge, I was at my first judge's conference, and the, uh, the uh, Chief Justice came over, and uh, Justice Uhlenhoff introduced me to him and reminded the Chief that I was the counsel in the item veto case, and and uh, the chief said, I bet you wondered why I participated not having heard the arguments. And I said, yes, I wondered about that. And he said, well, you didn't know it, but I had the clerk of court record those arguments. And he said I was able to listen to them and then participate in the decision making. And he came down on my side, so I was grateful. I thought you were going to tell me that he got, he got argument from, from the governor himself while he was swearing him in. Okay, so uh, that case was styled Weldon versus Ray. Weldon versus Ray, but there were other plaintiffs. There were 25 other plaintiffs. Uh, there are a couple names we might recognize out of that group, right? There are. Uh, who are they? Uh, there was a uh, long-term Iowa representative who was known, who's known today as Senator Charles Grassley, and. Uh, a young first-term representative from Leland, Iowa, whose name was Terry Branstead. So we had uh, Grassley, Branstead, and Ray, three of the longest-serving public servants in the state's history, all involved in that case. That's correct. All right, so the case went well for you. Um, private practice went well for you, and your next big move was to the Iowa District Court bench. Is that correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. When did you first start thinking about being a judge? Oh, I, I think it goes back to, to law school uh, that I contemplated maybe being a judicial officer. Uh, and then just cultivated over time, just continued to think about that? I, I did, and in the opening, the legislature uh, created a, a new judgeship in the uh, second judicial district, and uh, no no area of the district, and it's a huge district. It extends from Carroll on the west to Marshalltown on the east and north to the Minnesota border. And so no area within that 22 counties had a lock or had a claim to it. And so it was a free-for-all for, uh, for, uh, for the lawyers who thought they wanted to be judges. Now, I, I can't resist this because it, it just has sort of an obvious, um, at least relationship to the line item veto case in a strange way. Um, uh, see if you want to talk about what I'm asking for. You want more specifics? No, I think I know what you mean. Uh, the, the sitting governor at the time was Bob Ray. And uh, I, of course, had, had uh, named him as the principal defendant in my lawsuit. and and. Uh, we, we had won that lawsuit, and 18 months after the Supreme Court's decision, uh, I was sitting in his office uh, looking for an appointment as an Iowa district judge. And the governor was, was very gracious, and he said, he said, uh, look, he said, we're both lawyers. We, we uh, 
can reasonably disagree uh, about certain things. He said, I disagree with the Supreme Court's decision, and you support it. And he said, we'll just agree to disagree. And so it w worked out very well. He, I, I detected no animosity at all on his part. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, now, is that, a, is that a political process to get appointed to the Iowa courts, other than the governor's appointment? Well, it's a small p political point, uh, process in that in each judicial district, there's a uh, district court nominating commission consisting half lawyers and half lay people chaired by the uh, uh, senior judge in service in that district. Uh, the uh, governor appoints the lay people and the lawyers elect the representatives to the appointing commission. And that commission calls for applications and holds a hearing, interviews, and recommends two candidates to the governor, and the governor uh, is then permitted to choose whichever one he thinks will, uh, wants to be the judge. So you went to the governor's office as one of two at that point, one for the, then it was the political appointment? That's right. All right. Um, before we plow too far down into your judicial career, can we talk about the, the humble beginnings, maybe, of your judicial officer experience? I understood you're a police court judge. I was. What, what is a police court judge? What did that entail? Well, th this, this is before Iowa uh, adopted the Unified Trial Court Act in 1973. I, I served from 69 to 73 uh, as the police court judge in Iowa Falls. It was an unelected position appointed by the mayor, uh, and it was always given to the newest lawyer in town. The lawyers wanted a law-trained person to be the police court judge, and they always saddled the youngest lawyer in town with the job. And so when I showed up in town, I got the job. It was, uh, it was interesting and entertaining. Uh, Ellsworth College uh, is located in Iowa Falls, and so I had the usual college pranksters and, and, uh, and some drunk drivers and the, uh, strictly had criminal jurisdiction of a hundred dollar fine or thirty days in jail. It had no civil jurisdiction, whatever. So. Uh, probably good training, but at the same time, it must have gone into your thinking a little bit about: Do I want to take that step? I kind of like that role. Yes, it did. All right. Any particular lessons learned from that experience? That that there are two sides to every story, and that uh, some folks will be very truthful, and other folks won't. Okay, uh, tell us about your time on the Iowa State Court bench, if you would. I, I know that's a big question, but I, I'm particularly interested in just uh, how, how the transition went from being a general practitioner, and then maybe talk about how that Iowa State Court judge is really a generalist in a way, so maybe it's not quite as different. That's, that's, that's correct. Uh, the Iowa District Judge is a, a general jurisdiction judge, handles anything that comes down the pike in the way of a legal dispute criminal, civil, administrative law, uh, the, whole, the whole gamut. Uh, I enjoyed my time as a, an Iowa district judge. I enjoyed interacting with jurors and, and with, uh, with the, the parties involved, with, the law, with lawyers. Uh, it, it was fun. It was important work. And, uh, and it was rewarding work for me. I, I really enjoyed it. I, I was asked to, to try a criminal case in Blackhawk County, which is out of my district. Uh, the the uh, black public defender in Blackhawk County, Al Davidson, had been murdered on the streets in Waterloo by a masked man who approached him uh, carrying a 12-gauge shotgun and uh, yelled at him the epitaph that no one wants, uh, the epithet, pardon me, that no one wants to hear if he's black, and uh, shot him with a load of double-out buckshot. And he, uh, he died on the sidewalk. Uh, because he had appeared before all the judges in the first district, why, they de declined to uh, preside at the trial of the two men charged with his murder, and so, uh, the second district was asked to uh, 
send someone over and, and I, I got the mission. It turned out to be uh, what was then the longest trial in Iowa's history. It was more than eight weeks. Uh, we had, uh, oh, I think, a hundred and over a hundred witnesses and, and all kinds of exhibits. Uh, TV station KWWL in Waterloo had uh, been the first people to arrive at the scene before the first responders got there. And they ha had videotaped <coughs> Mr. Davidson lying on the sidewalk and expiring. They not only ran it as a news item for a couple of days, but they turned it into a promo as well for their station about how quickly they responded to newsworthy items and ran that promo many times uh, after the two defendants had been arrested and charged. And so I got a motion for change of venue. Uh, the legislature had just passed an act which permitted a, a change of venue motion to be granted but instead of moving the physical trial to a distant county, you took the parties and you picked the jury in the distant county and brought the jury back to the county where the crime had occurred. And so I did that in this case. And uh, we went over to Dubuque and picked a Dubuque jury and brought them back to Waterloo to try the case. We, uh, the, the sheriff in... Uh, in Waterloo was a man by the name of Kennedy, I believe Kennedy, no, Kennedy was the Dubuque sheriff, uh, was very helpful, very cooperative, and he arranged for uh, bus transportation for the jurors. Uh, we started uh, early on a Monday morning, broke mid-afternoon Wednesday, and bused them back to their families in Dubuque. They met the bus early on Thursday and came back to Waterloo for Thursday and Friday. But uh, it was a very interesting case. It was well tried. Uh, the lead uh, prosecutor was Jim Bush, who later became an Iowa district judge himself. And uh, defense counsel were, were well equipped for their duties. And uh, it was a well tried case. And the jury was out a day and convicted both men of, uh, of the murder of uh, Mr. Davidson. Well, before I hustle you through the rest of your state court experience, um, are there any other cases that stand out to you that uh, were of note or you think would be useful to hear about? Uh, not, not, not right off the top of my head. Ed. Okay. Uh, now, this district you served in, district... Well, there is one. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the legislature had passed the uh, Public Employees Collective Bargaining Act in 1975. And uh, I was assigned to, <clears throat> to Webster County, Fort Dodge at that time, and uh, had the first case uh, construing uh, the Public Employees Relations Act uh, uh, that arose out of, the Fort, out of Fort Dodge. I wrote my opinion, and uh, it, of course, immediately got appealed to the uh, Supreme Court so they could have Supreme Court direction, but it was... It was an affirmance for which I was grateful. But it, it, it today still, I think it still stands as the uh, seminal case in deciding what is a mandatory topic of collective bargaining for public employee organizations. Deciding a case on freshly minted law is uh, kind of an interesting proposition, isn't it? It sure is. All right, uh, I was going to move to, and I will move now to, the, the, the history of the district you served in. District 2, which was divided into a 2A and a 2B, but it had quite a, quite a stellar history in uh, Iowa judicial lore. Well, uh, if by stellar you mean that several of our judges went on to, to other uh, significant judgeships, I, I'll, I'll agree with you. Uh, Judge Fagg became a member of the uh, uh, Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals right from the Iowa District Court. Uh, had no appellate experience when he, when he was appointed by President Reagan. Uh, Judge Russell Hill from, the, from 2B ended up as a, uh, a United States bankruptcy judge in the Southern District. Uh, ended up as the chief judge of that court. Uh, Al Albert Habhab from Fort Dodge 
uh, was later appointed to the Iowa Court of Appeals. Uh, uh, Mark Cady uh, began his judicial career as a DAJ in Fort Dodge and ended up uh, as the current Chief Justice of the state of Iowa. Uh, so it, it has furnished uh, judges for higher courts. And I'd, I'd note another one um, that maybe wasn't a contemporary on the bench with you, but Justice Harvey Uhlenhoff, Justice Uhlenhoff. Was, was sort of a legendary figure, and some people still apply what's called the Uhlenhoff rule, and he's had a lasting influence on the, on the right. courts. Um, and of course, we had Judge David Hansen come out of there that went on to be a federal district court judge and court of appeals. So that's a pretty good, pretty good grouping. And some of those uh, judges became lifelong friends, right? Yes, they did. Uh, two of which went on to be on the federal bench, really were uh, two that you seem to spend a lot of time with. Judge Fag and Judge Hill and I <clears throat> chased each other around District 2B, uh, holding arraignments and holding trials and doing sentencings. And got to be pretty pretty darn good friends outside those. We did. All right. Um, when you came on the bench, I think about this for my own career, but who were your mentors or influences as you proceeded to you know, sort of start your judicial career? Justice Uhlenhoff was, <clears throat> I, I was privileged to count him as a mentor. He, uh, he taught me a lot about uh, trial practice. Uh, Justice, or Judge Paul Helwidge from Boone was a very good friend and a strong mentor. Uh, he, he took a lot of judges under his wing and gave them uh, helpful instruction and advice. Now, I always think of District 2 as not only producing good judges, but we've had some pretty decent law clerking come out of there, too. Uh, I, I, in, and I'm going to lead you into questions about law clerks and help us out a little bit, but as I recall, uh, magistrate Judge Scholes, who's now the federal magistrate judge, was a law clerk before he was a district judge up there. Is that That's right? He he was a law clerk in 2A. Did you ever encounter him? I did. Uh, I was the, uh, the there was a <clears throat> under Chief Justice Ward Reynoldson, there was a mandatory uh, crossover rule, so that the judges in uh, in 2A had to come down and serve in 2B and. 2B judges had to go up and serve in 2A, and I was on the border, so I became the crossover judge and, and was in Mason City quite often holding court, and uh, Mr. Scholes was in a, uh, just graduated law school and uh, was clerking in 2A. Mm -hmm. I, I, I omitted in the previous question that uh, my very good friend George Fagg and, uh, from Marshalltown, uh, he mentored me uh, when we both served as Iowa district judges. Uh, we had a, a couple of sessions uh, early in my, after my appointment, where he gave me the nuts and bolts of how the second district operated. And when I ended up on the Eighth Circuit, uh, he was already sitting there and, and could give me advice along those same lines. And uh, we will talk about Judge Fagg a little bit more as we get into the Eighth Circuit. Um, but question about Judge Fagg, did you actually practice with him as a practitioner at any time? No. Uh, well, yes and no. We both were school board attorneys. He was a school board attorney for Marshalltown, and I was a school board attorney for Iowa Falls. And uh, I remember uh, when uh, President Nixon uh, put on price controls uh, late in his uh, administration, why school boards were wondering how that affected them, and we both had to give advice to our respective boards. All right. Um, so, as I recall, you also took a run at the Iowa Supreme Court at one point during that. I, I did. I offered myself in 1983. Uh, for an opening on the court uh, that I did not uh, get. Uh, Judge Charles Woolley was, was appointed uh, to the Iowa Supreme Court at that time. And Judge Woolley, of course, became a federal judge later as well. He did. Um, 
was that a political process more so than the state court, uh, state district court bench? Well, I explained the commission that exists at the district court level. A similar commission exists at the Supreme Court level. And Judge Woolley and I found ourselves chasing each other around the state, being interviewed by the commissioners. Uh, it was, a, it was, as I remembered, it was early in the year, cold and and snowy and uh, traipsing around trying to get an audience with the commissioners. Now, your next move was to the federal bench, which I think we all know it does have some element of political appointment built into it. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to just cover some the politics and the, the political involvement briefly, if we could. So you mentioned, I think, even in your younger days, the little bit of politics swirling around you and your family. Um, tell us about the, your involvement in politics from that point forward. Well, I, I uh, uh, Mr. Jones, uh, who I've already uh, told you about, uh, was a state committee man on the Republican State Central Committee. And he took me under his wing. I attended a couple of Republican state conventions as a junior delegate. I remember meeting Attorney General Herbert Brownell during the first Eisenhower administration. As a, I was a young man, 12, 13 maybe. Uh, and uh, when I was practicing in Iowa Falls, I was a precinct committee man and then served as Hardin County Republican chairman. And in 1974, uh, I assisted uh, Chuck Grassley in his first run for Congress in, the, in, the, in that election, both in the primary and in the general. So was that your first encounter with Chuck Grassley? Yeah, he was a client in the item veto case, and that's how I got to know him. And then he asked me if I'd be his chairman in Hardin County, and I, I agreed. Later on in that spring campaign, in that primary campaign, uh, he ended up in the hospital in Iowa City with a non-malignant growth on his leg, and it took him out of the action for about six weeks. Uh, that was a five-way primary race to fill H.R. Gross's seat in Congress. And under Iowa law, you had to win 35% of the vote in the primary to avoid it going to a district convention to choose the candidate. And so we worked hard for Mr. Grassley. Uh, he called me up from Iowa City, and he was lamenting that he was laid up for that time, and when he got out, he'd be on crutches. And he asked me if I would speak at uh, some county conventions on his behalf, and I agreed to do that. And, and uh, uh, that brought our relationship even closer. So we know Senator Grassley now had a very successful career, and what is it, that he hadn't lost an election or has never lost an election or something? So we were, you were successful in, in that we venture. We won 43 percent of the vote in that five-person five race when we only needed 35. And then when did he run for Senate? I don't recall. He, ran, he spent six years in the House and then ran for the Senate in 1980. Okay, so you were appointed to the federal district bench in 1985 by then President Reagan. Um, was, was there any other part of the politics that, that became involved for you uh, during that appointment process? Well, there were third, uh, Senator Grassley uh, uh, asked for, as he always does, those people who want to be a judge to throw their hat in the ring. And there were 13 of us who uh, told him that we would be willing to serve in that capacity. Uh, he interviewed all of us, uh, every one of us singly, uh, in uh, Cedar Rapids, and then chose three of us uh, to recommend to the president for consideration. They were the late Justice uh, Jim Carter from the Iowa Supreme Court, my chief judge at the time, the late Newt Draheim, and, and me. And then it became a <clears throat> we were each individually invited to Washington for uh, conferences at the Justice Department and interviews there. 
uh, and then the Justice Department, Mr. Meese was the Attorney General, and uh, they made their recommendation to the President as to who he should appoint. And you were a candidate from Iowa Falls for a job that was going to be in Cedar Rapids, and just for those who are listening in who don't know our geography, that's, that's not next door, that's a couple hours away. Did you meet any uh, resistance or a feeling of reluctance to bring in somebody from outside Cedar Rapids, which is the second biggest city in Iowa? Well, Justice Carter, of course, was a Cedar Rapidian and had the support of the Lynn County Bar very solidly. Judge McManus, this, the then sitting judge uh, in the Northern District who had uh, announced that he was taking senior status, had amalgamated uh, the court functions at Cedar Rapids. Uh, federal District Court in Iowa used to be held in Dubuque, Waterloo, Cedar Rapids, Mason City, Fort Dodge, and Sioux City. Uh, I think it was because that's where the trains ran in the days when they were set up. And uh, Judge McManus had pretty well consolidated the western uh, part of the district uh, headquartered in Sioux City and the eastern part of the district at Cedar Rapids. I, I as a practitioner, uh, grew rather tired of driving from Iowa Falls, Iowa to Cedar Rapids, Iowa to, to see a, or find a federal judicial officer. And so I indicated to the people in the western part of the district that, that I would uh, hold court in Fort Dodge and, and uh, Mason City. Uh, that was attractive to the practitioners in that area. Uh, a lot of the legal business had become concentrated in Cedar Rapids and in the Cedar Rapids firms. And they, of course, were somewhat reluctant to have any uh, competition with respect to that. But uh, it worked out and I, I was uh, willing to come to Cedar Rapids and live in Cedar Rapids and be headquartered in Cedar Rapids. But uh, there was some uh, polite infighting that was going on. Was there a courthouse in Fort Dodge and Mason City at the time? Yeah, well, there, was, there were court facilities. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the government blended a courthouse with a post office facility. And the post office facility had the first floor and the court usually had the second floor. And that was true in Mason City, it was true in Dubuque, it was true uh, in Fort Dodge. Uh, it, Fort Dodge had a relatively new courthouse built in the, in the 60s. Uh, the late Judge William C. Hansen had designed that, that facility and it was, a, had, it was a very large courtroom, had a very large well. In fact, as a federal district judge, I moved a case from Cedar Rapids to Fort Dodge to try it there because I had 14 lawyers and uh, I think seven defendants to try all at one time and the well in uh, Cedar Rapids just wouldn't accommodate us. So we moved, every, I had a, a million document dump, a discovery dump that I had to supervise and there was space in the courthouse in Fort Dodge for that to be used there. And when we're talking a million documents, we're not talking about on a computer disk at that? No, we're not. We're talking about paper. All right. So. Uh, Currently, I serve as the bankruptcy judge and ride that very circuit of Dubuque, um, Fort Dodge, Waterloo, Mason City, and there are still signs of the court there when I come there, but we've let go of all the facilities except for Sioux City. That's true. Did that happen during your time? Uh, yes. Uh, Waterloo had already been... Uh discontinued as a court point when I arrived. Uh, Dubuque was not being used. Uh, the only time I used Dubuque was as a state judge when we picked the jury in the, in the murder case from Waterloo. That let us use that federal courtroom to do a jury selection there. Uh, but uh, Fort Dodge still had a, and at one time had a deputy clerk clerk's office operation in Fort Dodge. 
And as I recall, Dubuque served, Dubuque served as the headquarters for the court for a period of time. Many, 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 many years. Uh, the, the, the court was fragmented, and, and uh, Judge McManus is to be credited for consolidating it. Uh, the clerk was in, uh, in Dubuque. The U.S. attorney was in Sioux City. Uh, you can't get much farther apart in the district than that. You got a job in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and as I understand our conversation, Mrs. Hansen had grown fond of Iowa Falls, and you were going to relocate uh, you and the young family away from there. That's right. How did that process go? Well, uh, the Eighth Circuit Council uh, had directed that the, that the uh, new judge in uh, Cedar Rapids uh, had to reside in Lynn County, and so <clears throat> my former law partner, Mr. McNeil had graduated from Cornell College, which is located in Mount Vernon. And he said, Dave, he said, if you're going to locate in Lynn County, look hard at Mount Vernon. And we did, and Ginger loved it. We found a house that she liked right across the street from Cornell College. And we told our sons, who were 14 and 11 at the time, uh, that we would buy a house in whatever school district they wanted to attend. And so they spent a day in the Mount Vernon system, and they spent a day in the Linmar system. And one wanted to go to Mount Vernon, and one wanted to go to Linmar. So I still had to make the decision. And we located Mount Vernon. And that worked out pretty well for you and your family, didn't it? It sure has, yeah. yeah. So you left what you had is, is, I guess I didn't cover this, but you had a farm in Iowa Falls. I did. Uh, I had a, a half interest in, in a farm in Iowa Falls that I've maintained over the years. So you didn't sell the farm when you moved back here. No. We were in the throes of the farm crisis at the time. We were. Did that have any bearing on what you decided to do with the farm? Well, uh, the uh, value of Iowa farmland was, was decreasing during those years, and uh, there was nothing really to do but to hold on to it and uh, hope a corner would turn. One of the first cases that I encountered as a federal district judge was the FDIC's uh, motion or uh, petition to close the uh, Citizen State Bank in Iowa Falls, Iowa. Uh, I knew all the board of directors and uh, the officers of that bank have, had worked with them. Our firm didn't represent it, but uh, our clients bank there. And so I, uh, I thought, uh, discretion being the better part of valor, that I would just uh, ask Judge McManus if he would preside over that uh, petition, and he, d he gracefully did. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to ask you to cover this a little bit more um, as we move forward and talk about other judges, but that farm crisis was a, was a big deal for the people of Iowa, but it was also a pretty big deal for the judicial system. It was. Plenty of work on lots and lots of levels. Um, you, you know, before I depart the subject, though, I'd like to ask you about the Iowa Falls House. The property values turned back up, but you went ahead and kept the farm anyway. What went into the thinking there? A place for retirement. And we had rented out the farmhouse over the years, and it was available, and, and uh, so we uh, we took it back uh, maybe ten years ago, and have been spending weekends there, and recently moved back permanently. So it ended up being a pretty good idea to keep a hold of the farm after. I think so. Did you did you ever consider yourself to be a, a farmer, lawyer, or a gentleman farmer of some sort? No, no. I've always rented out. Uh, my, the fellow who owns the other half and I have always rented out to, uh, to a tenant farmer. Anyway, you came aboard about the same time as another uh, federal, newly minted federal judge here, and I think he came aboard shortly after you, and that's bankruptcy judge Mike Malloy. And he got the, the farm crisis duties, but uh, also started a very long friendship with you. That's correct. Uh, actually, it was just the reverse. Uh, uh, judge Malloy was appointed bankruptcy judge about six weeks before I was appointed the district judge. And so he had already been in town when, when I showed up. But uh, we had to coordinate a lot of cases uh, very early in our careers, and uh, I grew to respect and admire Judge Malloy very much, and we, be had, we became uh, very good friends and, and still are.
Now, you and Judge Malloy got a chance to innovate inside and outside the courtroom, as I like to say. Um, I think you know what I'm talking about from my own personal experience. One of the first cases I got to see as a law student was, uh, was a hearing you held in the Morris Plan case. Is that, yeah. is that correct? Do you recall that one? I do. That case was pending in uh, Judge Malloy's bankruptcy court. I had a piece of it in federal district court and Judge Roger Peterson of the Iowa District Court in Blackout County had a share in it. And uh, there were many lawyers involved, and we detected that we were getting sort of whipsawed between the various parties <coughs> and their positions, and uh, in the discovery phase particularly. And so uh, we decided to hold a joint uh, session of all three courts at the same time in the federal district court courtroom. And so when the clerk of court convened court that day, he convened the Iowa District Court in and for Blackhawk County, the United States Bankruptcy Court for the Northern District of Iowa, and the United States District Court for the Northern District of Iowa, and all three of us took the bench. Uh, we heard the arguments together. We entered an order that all three of us signed and everybody had to follow the same lead. And it, it worked very well, and uh, the whipsawing ceased. And as I recall, I reported back to a law professor about my experience, said, well, what did you see in court? And I said, well, I had, it was a hearing where there was a federal district judge, a bankruptcy judge, and a state court judge, and I wanted to explain. And the professor, I think, interrupted and said, wait a minute, are you sure you got that right? And I said, oh, I'm absolutely sure I have this right. And he said, can they do that? And I said, well, they did. <laughs> but there was some question of innovation at that time, that's, wasn't that's there? That's true. And it was, it was a decision made that, not only for the whipsawing, but also that was a sprawling case with lots and lots of lawyers and fees and whatnot, and you thought that would help streamline it a little we bit? Did. We did. And it really did bring some order to that case, if I recall. Yeah. All right, so you and Judge... Nobody appealed uh, right. uh, on, on, on the point that that there was a question of whether or not Judge Peterson had jurisdiction outside of District 1. So you and Judge Malloy, I called innovators in that way, but I also referenced in outside the courtroom and that the two of you started thinking early on in your days about the future, uh, the future of the federal courts in Cedar Rapids. Judge McManus had tried to bring us under an umbrella here, and uh, it was getting pretty tight in that federal building. It was. In fact, uh, Judge Malloy had uh, moved out and was uh, officing and had a courtroom in uh, what was then called the Ground Transportation Building. Uh, and we knew that, uh, that the space, uh, space was designed only for one judge, and uh, Judge McManus and I were both there, and we knew the caseload was, was increasing at a steady rate. And uh, I'll give, uh, I need to give credit to Judge Malloy, who first perceived that we ought to be thinking about a new courthouse as opposed to an annex or, or a supplemental uh, space. Uh, Tom Aller uh, was then working for the mayor and uh, as the mayor's assistant, and he came to me and, and said, what do, we, what do we need to do to get in line to get a new courthouse? And, and we contacted uh, the senators involved and, and started the, the spade work with the General Services Administration, which is the government's landlord, and uh, uh, developed uh, over the course of nearly 20 years a plan for a new this new federal courthouse that we're sitting in today. This new phenomenal award-winning federal courthouse. Uh, I don't know if you saw that recently, that it's been awarded some nice awards on design, so we're very fortunate to have this facility. Uh, when you came aboard, you had uh, Judge Malloy was a new federal judge, you were a new federal judge, and then you and Judge O'Brien had to pick a new magistrate judge soon thereafter. We did and we picked uh, Magistrate Judge <coughs> John Jarvey to be the new magistrate. When, when I uh, uh, first came here, uh, Magistrate uh, uh, Jim Hodges was the magistrate judge here, and uh, after about 18 months, he decided to return to the practice uh, with the Shuttleworth firm, and uh, so that left the opening. Uh, and Mr. Jarvey was then an Assistant Attorney General of the United States, 
uh, trying drug cases all over the, the country. He had been a law clerk for Chief Judge O'Brien and uh, offered himself uh, to be a magistrate judge here. He's very young and uh, was appointed and just did an outstanding job. He's now a United States District Judge, of course, and the Chief Judge in the Southern District. Now, you and Judge Jarvey had uh, plenty of work to do to, together to process your caseload. Yeah. Uh, it was a very busy time in the courts, if I recall. Well, the U.S. Attorney's Office was just going bananas with indictments. Uh, the war on drugs was at its height. I remember one day uh, the grand jury returned 89 indictments. And so we had to arrange for, or magistrate had to arrange for counsel for everybody. And the defense lawyers uh, perceived that if they stuck together, uh, the, the prosecutors would have speedy trial problems with trying to get 90, 89 cases to trial within the limits of the, of, of the Speedy Trial Act. And uh, we got wind of that. And I called uh, Chief Judge Don Lay of the Eighth Circuit and told him my problem and that we needed help. And he arranged for five other district judges to be assigned to Cedar Rapids to handle the trials. And once that happened, uh, the dam broke and the plea discussions began and, and uh, we managed to resolve all those cases without violating the Speedy Trial Act. But it, it, you're not getting 89 indictments every week, but there was a heavy load that continued even beyond that that's, one. That's true. There were indictments every week. And you, you mentioned the war on drugs. The sentencing guidelines were starting to come on the scene. The, some of the sentencing statutes had been changed. Were there other factors that, that contributed to that heavier workload? That those were the two principal ones. The, the, the advent of the sentencing guidelines meant that a, a criminal sentencing that would usually take an hour under the previous law was now taking half to three quarters of a day because there were so many elements of a sentence that the parties could, uh, could argue about and dispute. And you had to take evidence and make fact findings on all of these individual elements that added up to the sentence. Now, we'll cover this a little more as you went to the circuit, but you, you got in on sort of the ground floor of the sentencing guidelines and took an interest in that and developed, whether it was voluntary or involuntary, you got uh, your fill of sentencing material. Well, uh, the late Judge Hal Viator was the chief judge in the Southern District, and he called me up and he said, they're having a train-the-trainer seminar. The Sentencing Commission was having a train-the-trainer seminar a uh, week long out in uh, Denver. And nobody in the Southern District could shake loose to go, but he was wondering if I, w if I would go out and then come uh, attend that seminar and then come back and hold a seminar for all the federal judges, prosecutors, and uh, defense lawyers uh, in federal court. And so I did that, and I held uh, seminars in Des Moines and Sioux City and Cedar Rapids explaining this, this new vehicle called the sentencing guidelines. Did you do those with uh, all the groups together? Did you split them up into split them up. In interest groups? Yes. Um, wow, that uh, sounds like a lot of extra work there at a busy time. Well, I, I had to educate myself. I was the one who was going to be applying them. And so uh, I, learned, I learned something at each new presentation. Now, I've heard this uh, next question I have brought up by Cedar Rapids practitioners several times, and I think even Des Moines lawyers, that it, those were pretty interesting days when you had uh, Judge Hanson, Judge Malloy, and Judge Jarvie all under one roof over there in one courthouse. Uh, I guess some people said a judicial all-star team. You've all gone on to appointments to what they would call a higher, higher office. But it also seemed that you there was a sense of it worked. There wasn't a bunch of egos running around or that. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, my two colleagues were, were very cooperative and uh, we all had a, a, a the single mission in mind was to get the cases decided and out and uh, those that were going to be appealed be appealed so we'd get some guidance from the uh, Court of Appeals as to what all this new language, these new concepts uh, in sentencing uh, meant. 
but uh, we each helped each other out and uh, I think the public profited from it. And have, and have been supporters and sounding boards for each other over the years yeah. since. Yeah. You've had some really significant and interesting cases throughout your career. Now we're at the federal district court stage. Is there any particular cases you want to highlight? There's a couple that jumped to my mind, but I'll let you take a pick first. Well, uh, I mentioned the case in Fort Dodge, the antitrust case, uh, which involved 14 uh, uh, lawyers and, and I think it was seven defendants that were tried together. Was that a criminal or civil? It was a, it was a criminal case. And the uh, Department of Justice sent in a trial team, an antitrust trial team from Chicago to uh, represent the government. And each individual defendant had his own, had his own counsel. We had some very good defense lawyers. Uh, that was lengthy and uh, complicated. Uh, it was, uh, it, it resolved all right, but uh, uh, we, we got it done. And that was the one where the million documents, That's uh, right. real tangible documents was involved. I suppose there was plenty of paper in the courtroom there, at the time. Yeah. Uh, Cedar Rapids cases, anything jump out to you there? Well, uh, I think about three years into my tenure, the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office was very active in prosecuting drug cases, and they brought charges against three Cedar Rapids businessmen for dealing in cocaine. And uh, I disqualified the local prosecutor's office from trying the case, and they brought in a trial team from the Department of Justice in Washington to try the case. Uh, it was uh, well covered by the press, and we tried the three defendants together, and uh, all three men were convicted, and I sentenced all three of them to prison term. And I, and I do recall there were some follow-along cases that developed substantial assistance under the guidelines. So that was one that got the rare combination of media coverage and then kind of the legal coverage as That's well. Uh, another one that jumps out to me, and I don't know if you want to comment on this, there was a prominent lawyer in town who was well known who got charged with tax evasion. I just remember that as a young lawyer, and that one seemed to get quite a bit of attention. Well, we had two lawyers who, who, who ran afoul of the law in those years. Uh, one was a bankruptcy practitioner who uh, pilfered uh, trust funds and uh, he ended up pleading guilty and I sentenced him uh, to prison. Uh, and the, the income tax evasion lawyer uh, also uh, was uh, the proof offered by the government showed that he was skimming his, his law office uh, uh, income and not reporting it and uh, he was convicted and uh, I sentenced him to prison as well. In those cases as I recall got some uh, media coverage and certainly some bar coverage because they were people that were known to the bar around here. Yes they were. Uh, the, the bankruptcy lawyer had a national reputation. Uh, we've covered the courthouses in in the northern district now did you try any other cases in Fort Dodge other than the uh, antitrust case? I, I tried, uh, tried two men for taking down a bank out there uh, that, that was an interesting case. Uh, but I, uh, unless my mind is drawing a blank unless you have uh, I, I don't recall and I no and I and I only threw that out there because I was going to ask you whether you ever even used the Mason City courtroom for a trial or no I never used the Mason City courtroom because I was up there thinking I would dust it and bring it out of mothballs but the bench has been taken out That's up right. there the GSA sold the courtroom off but they still have the paneling and somebody uses it for something but I do my business in uh, in a humble room downstairs but it still does say post office and courthouse on that building. Now, Judge, you um, developed a long line of law clerks, especially after you came on the federal bench. And maybe we can just start with that. When you came on the federal bench, how does that differ for law clerk assignments from the state court bench? Well, uh, the first law clerks in Iowa uh, were, I believe, in the second district, in, in 2B. 
uh, and they were shared law clerks. Uh, my law clerk was 50 miles away from me and I shared him with three other judges, uh, which meant you couldn't really use the law clerk to any great uh, benefit. Uh, you didn't have an individual clerk. In the federal system, at the time I became a federal district judge, you were entitled to uh, two law clerks and you also had what was known as a courtroom deputy clerk of court uh, who kept the uh, dockets and the, the papers and assisted in trials. Uh, and the practice here had been to uh, appoint a recent law school graduate to that position. And so in effect, you had about two and a half law clerks that you could use. Uh, when I got to the circuit court, uh, you were entitled to three law clerks and as chief judge you were entitled to four so, and they were devoted to you and, and you didn't share them with, with any other judge. And we talked about the state court law clerks and called out a few names there. Um, how many total federal law clerks did you have before we go into the particulars? I, I believe I had 31 if, if my memory is right. Okay, uh, and, and you started in the Federal District Court 1985, and then you went to the Circuit Court in 1992. 1991. 1991, December, you corrected December me. Of 91. I'm sorry, you're, you're right about that. And so you had uh, six years of two, and then you took a transition, and then you added, started to beef up to three, and... Yes, that's true, but uh, some judges appoint a clerk only for a year. I. Uh, I required my clerks to serve two-year clerkships. I figured the first year was for the clerk and the second year was for me. And uh, although I have had a handful of one-year clerks uh, over the course of the years, but uh, I've been blessed with exceptional law clerks and uh, exceptional lawyers. Now you took the, the business of hiring your law clerks pretty seriously too, didn't you? I did, I did. I conducted rather extensive interviews with each of them. And a, f a federal judge gets a hundred applications for every clerkship that he has and uh, willow willowing out uh, was a difficult task because uh, you could hire 50 of them and, and, uh, and still not get all of the quality that was there. You were looking for somebody that fit you, your chambers, your model? That's true. That's true. And as I recall, you, uh, you wanted somebody that the others in the chambers would be comfortable with. I tried to treat my chamber staff as, uh, as, as family. I, I wanted to know about their children, their spouses, their backgrounds, uh, their hopes and dreams. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, some judges treat their law clerks uh, just as memo writers and they slip their memo under your door and you slip a memo back. Uh, but uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't do that. My door was always open to my clerks. They didn't have to get an appointment with my secretary in order to see me. They could walk in any time of the day and talk about any topic that was on their mind or, or troublesome to them. Uh, do you subscribe to the view of my uh, dear friend and law professor, Pat Bauer, who described uh, what he thought a good federal judge clerk relationship to be you have your own father in your family but then the federal judge is your sort of father in the law he calls it yeah i i would uh, i would agree with that and you continue to have relationships with them when they leave the chambers certainly certainly i've kept up with most uh, i i know what most all of them are doing right now and quite a bit about their families and yes. on top of that that must be very rewarding it is Right, let's particularly at Christmas time when you get all these cards and the additions to the families. You bet. So 1991, late 91, you were appointed the U.S. Court of Appeals by President George H.W. Bush. That's right. Or Bush 1, if we were trying to keep it clear. How did that come to pass? Well, uh, I'd been appointed by President Reagan to the district court and had uh, been on the district court for about three years when Judge Jerry Haney from Duluth took senior status, creating a vacancy on the Eighth Circuit. 
and I was asked to come to Washington by the Justice Department to interview for that seat. Uh, it was a Minnesota seat, but the president had decided that he was going to look outside of Minnesota, uh, at least to survey what's there in order to find a successor. And so I went in and was interviewed by, uh, at that time, uh, uh, Attorney General Thornburg, the former governor of Pennsylvania, who was serving as the Attorney General. I met with his staff and, and uh, had the interviews. Eventually, Judge uh, Jim Loken uh, received that appointment. Uh, one of the other people interviewed for it was Judge Morris Arnold, my good friend from Arkansas. Uh, neither one of us were successful in 89, but in 91, the Congress passed the Federal Judgeship Act of 1990 and uh, created an 11th judge on the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. Because it was a new appointment, no particular state had a had a legacy claim to it, and so it was a free-for-all. Uh, Iowa at that time had only one active judge on the court, and there were those of us, including me, who thought we were entitled to two given our caseloads. And so we made the argument uh, to Senator Grassley that this ought to be an Iowa seat, and he went uh, worked very hard in it. Arkansas wanted it. Uh, they had my friend Morris Shepard Arnold ready to assume the duties. And uh, a lot of people didn't know it, but Arkansas had a congressman whose name was John Paul Hammerschmidt. And Mr. Hammerschmidt and then President Bush had been freshman congressmen together when they were both elected to congressmen. So Mr. Hammerschmidt could call up the White House at any time and talk to his friend, George H.W. Bush. Well, uh, that was also the time of the first Gulf War. And if you will remember correctly, uh, Senator Grassley voted against uh, the participation in the first Gulf War. And everybody thought that that ensured Judge Moore Shepard Arnold's appointment. Well, it, it didn't, and uh, Senator Grassley was able to prevail in his arguments with the White House, even though he was viewed with some sus suspicion there because of his vote on the war. And uh, I was, I was uh, able to be appointed. In Senator Grassley's service on the Judiciary Committee and and actually his relationship with Senator Harkin, I think all kind of contributed to an ability to work on those judicial... You bet matters. it did. Senator Harkin and Senator Grassley have worked collaboratively on federal judicial appointments in this state. Uh, when the Republicans are in power, uh, Senator Harkin has supported Senator Grassley's choices. When the Democrats have been in control of the Congress, uh, Senator Grassley has supported Senator Harkin's selections for judicial appointments, and it's worked to Iowa's benefit. Now, I don't think it's a uh, stretch to say that it's been a privilege of your life to actually become friends with Senator Harkin as well, even though you wore different jerseys, as, that, he, as he used to say. That's, that's very correct. Uh, uh, his wife, Ruth Harkin, was the county prosecutor, county attorney in Story County, when I was a state court judge, and we tried, tried many cases together. And uh, I got to know the, the uh, then representative Harkin uh, through her. He, uh, he represented my old district when I had worked in the Congress, the old fighting seventh Iowa district. Uh, Iowa had eight congressmen in those years. Today we have four. Yes, I, uh, I, I consider the Harkins as very good friends. And uh, you mentioned Ruth Harkin, who was uh, the prosecutor in her day, and that was a bit unusual at the time you were on the Iowa State Court bench to have a, a woman in the practice was still a fairly new idea, and particularly a woman as a prosecutor. That's correct. Yes. When their first child was born, she brought the baby to the courthouse and kept a, 
a crib in her office. And, and for some, that was an adjustment, yep. uh, and some adjusted better than others. Uh, I, I think I shared this publicly at one time that uh, Roxanne Conlon had told me about um, her ventures to get herself going in the practice, and that she had crossed paths with you and felt you, uh, you helped advocate for her under, uh, a, a, I'm not going to say duress, but uh, certainly not a welcome audience. Well, I, uh, the Hardin County Bar Association was a very vibrant group in those years, and I had invited Ms. Conlon. Uh, she was then an assistant attorney general working for Richard Turner, and I had invited her to uh, come to Iowa, uh, come to Eldora for one of our meetings and tell us about Title VII of, of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, and she came up and gave a very nice presentation about uh, the elements of that act, including uh, the provision prohibiting sex discrimination. And uh, you can imagine that there were a number of white-haired male lawyers in the audience to whom that concept was uh, almost foreign. And uh, she took a good, be good bit of heat uh, concerning it that evening. And uh, I tried to come to her defense by uh, telling my colleagues that, look, the lady is here just to tell us what the law is. Uh, that fight's over, fellas. We, we've got to learn to live with it. So. Now, she characterized it like this to me. You, you react as, as you want. That uh, She said she took quite a bit of heat, and she felt that you, you tried to step in and defend her, not that she needed any of her own defending, in <laughs> Roxanne Conlon's own words. I agree, I agree with that, that summation. But you've continued, you continued over the years to be friendly with Roxanne and uh, other lawyers that have made their way up through the ranks, Certainly. and that's been one of the rewards of your career. Certainly has. All right. So we are now at the circuit court, and we'll transition back to that. Um, I guess we talked about more Shepard Arnold in Arkansas and others laying claims, and that's not unusual, especially with states like Minnesota and Missouri, as I remember, who say we've got a bigger population, we deserve it, and we have these fights even to this day, I think. But you also had some internal Iowa competition for that seat, didn't you? I, I did. Very uh, good competition. Uh, Senator Grassley has, has always sent three names to the president for any vacancy. Uh, and when, uh, I've already told you who the other uh, candidates were when I was up for the, uh, for the uh, district court job. Uh, at the circuit court level, the three names that he sent uh, included uh, Justice Linda Newman off of the Iowa Supreme Court and a lawyer from Davenport whose name was Charles Brook. And uh, all three of us were called to Washington, had our interviews, and, uh, and then the Justice Department made its mind up. And Linda Newman uh, was a very notable and very well-respected justice of the Iowa Supreme Court, in addition to being the first woman appointed to the Iowa Supreme Court. That's true. As I recall, there were some articles that were run at the time or something that advocated for her. Um, yes. Uh, in fact, to my surprise, I opened uh, the Des Moines Register one morning to find an article uh, containing an interview by uh, then Chief Judge Donald P. Lay of the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals indicating how welcome uh, uh, a woman would be for that court and uh, uh, in effect promoting uh, the appointment of a woman for the court. Uh, he called me the next day and uh, uh, said he'd been mis misquoted. But, <laughs> but it still was a, it, not a feeling of uh, great endorsement from yes. him at that point in time. Um, well, when you went from the district court to the circuit court, you took your law clerks and your courtroom deputy to fill out your chambers along with your longtime judicial assistant to make your chamber staff. That's correct. And as I recall this, shortly after, I mean months, few months into it, the, the longest serving clerk you had had a really good opportunity that got dropped right in his lap. That, that's right. Uh, his name was Webb Wasmer and he, he was a Cedar Rapidian graduate of Penn's Law School. I always called I always called Webb my Philadelphia lawyer, and uh, he, was, he, he is a brilliant lawyer, but uh, he had a chance to go with a local law firm, 
that he wanted to accept, and I certainly wasn't going to stand in his career path. And so I uh, said, just take it. And that uh, created an opening for me to fill. I uh, had a phone call from uh, a, a judge in South Dakota who said, uh, we've got a young law clerk out here who's just a crackerjack. She's a graduate of Yale University. Uh, Harvard University's law school, Duke undergraduate, and uh, we think she'd make a great circuit law clerk. And I said, well, I've got an opening. I'll, I'll take a look at her. And so I went out to Sioux City for another clerk's wedding, and she came in from Pierre, South Dakota, for the interview, and it turned out to be a woman whose name is Jane Kelly. And Jane clerked for me uh, for a year, and then became the federal public, uh, assistant federal public defender here in Cedar Rapids. Uh, she she uh, took uh, further legal studies at the University of Illinois, where she taught uh, legal research and writing. And then came back and took the job as assistant federal defender. And today she is a uh, United States Circuit Judge Jane Kelly, sitting on the Eighth Circuit on my old court. And sitting right down the hall today as we speak, right? That's right, sitting right down the hall. All right, now, just as a, a, an interesting moment here, her name has come up on the national level for things, and you have another member of the Eighth Circuit whose name has been mentioned, who's an Iowan, who also came across your path at approximately that time. You remember That's what right. I'm talking about? I know, you're, you're talking about Stephen Collins. Yes. And, uh, in fact, uh, Depending on whether the president is Republican or Democrat, uh, each of them have been shortlisted for the Supreme Court. Uh, most recently, Jane was one of the five, the final five, that the president looked very hard at uh, before he nominated Merrick Garland for the court. And uh, on the Republican shortlist, uh, Judge Collins' name frequently appears. Uh, along with a, a co-colleague of his, who both were in the Office of Legal Policy together at, at DOJ, and that's uh, Judge Kavanaugh on the uh, D.C. Circuit. But uh, my, uh, my introduction to uh, Judge Colleton was when he was uh, a law clerk for Chief Justice Rehnquist. And he was back visiting his parents in Iowa City, and he came up and introduced himself at the courthouse here. And that's when I, when I met him first. He then was an assistant uh, United States attorney in this district, appeared in my court. He went on to uh, be picked by uh, uh, Kenneth Starr for the uh, uh, Whitewater investigation in Arkansas. And he won, uh, I think, the only conviction of a major person in that whole thing, he convicted the sitting governor of Arkansas, Jim Guy Tucker, of offenses, and, uh, and then came back to Iowa, was the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Iowa, uh, before he was appointed by, uh, uh, by President George W. Bush to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. He, he took my seat. Right, and as we play that out, it turned out that your introduction to Judge Kelly and Judge Colleton was very close in time, yes. and funny enough, they became uh, adversaries as uh, uh, prosecutor and defense lawyer over the years, and I think enjoy a good friendship to this day. That's right. All right, Judge, we've got uh, uh, a whole court that you got to know as you came on. You had been a trial court judge. We talked about colleagues, but when you transitioned to an appellate court, there is not just a collegial body of, of friends and colleagues to, to bounce things off of. You have to make decisions with them. That's true. And that was a different brand of decision. Oh, a, di a district court is a lone ranger. He, he makes his own decision. He or she makes his, make their own decisions and uh, live with the results of an appeal. But when you're on an appellate court, you have to convince other members of that court whose commissions from, the, from a president of the United States reads just like yours does, that you're right and that your position should prevail. And uh, sometimes you manage to do that and other times uh, they convince you that their position is right. It's a, 
It's a very uh, collegial, uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't get heated, but uh, it's, a, it's generally a very collegial uh, method of arriving at a decision. Now one of your hallmarks of your career, if I might say so, has been uh, as a man about professionality and civility, uh, yes, professionalism and civility, I should say. And tell me how that served you in that setting. Oh, uh, first of all, I wasn't the only one on our court who was committed to that concept. Uh, the late Richard Shepard Arnold of Arkansas, uh, a, a gentleman of the highest order, first in his class at Yale, first in his class at Harvard, clerk for Mr. Justice Brennan on the Supreme Court, uh, was a gentleman of the Old South. I can, I can see in my mind's eye Richard in his blue and white seersucker suit and white buck shoes. Uh, he, he was just a fantastic lawyer as well. But uh, he, he led by example. He was the chief judge of the court for, for several years after I joined it. Well, and you I just, you sure. I, as I recall, when, when you went to the court, it didn't necessarily feel like that. There were some, there were some rough feelings. There had been a little bit of partisanship, maybe, that had been displayed a little more publicly, and it was a little tattered. Well, you can read about it in, a, in a, an issue of the uh, William Mitchell Law Review that uh, took, a, took a stab at describing and trying to support the, the idea that the Eighth Circuit was divided politically. Uh, so it, it, it had been a, a court of a, a, a rather severe liberal bent uh, before the Reagan and, and uh, George H.W. Bush appointees joined it. Uh, Judge Fagg told me one time that the, uh, that the four Reagan appointees to the court were sometimes uh, uh, referred to as the gang of four. And he said that when uh, the fifth appoint appointment came, it was a, then a ten-judge court, but when the fifth appointment came from, uh, from George H.W. Bush, that, no, from Reagan himself, uh, that he said, we're now the gang of five. And so, yes, I think there was, there, there were some, uh, some difficult feelings for a while. But that, that, that all was overcome. Um, you attribute that, a lot of that to Richard Arnold becoming I, the chief I, judge. I do. You want to talk about that a little bit? Well, you, you just knew that Richard would listen to you. He would hear you out. Uh, he may disagree with you. And if he agreed with you, you had a stalwart on your side because he, he made very compelling arguments. And as I understood it from you and from others, that that was, that was a feeling shared sort of bipartisan and, it, and it across was. the court. He had great respect from each of the judges. Okay, you've told us about Richard Arnold, um, and we've talked about him being the chief judge, but he's also, along with his brother, uh, a notable in that they became the two circuit judges sitting together not too long after he became the chief judge. Isn't that right? That's correct. Uh, Within six months, uh, uh, I, I've indicated that Morris and I had been considered before for the court. And when Judge Lay took senior status uh, in January after my appointment in December, uh, why uh, Morris Arnold's name was advanced for that vacancy and, and uh, uh, he was uh, appointed and confirmed and uh, or nominated and confirmed and appointed by, by, the, by the president. And beyond being brothers, as I remember it, uh, Morris Arnold was appointed on the Republican side and oh, Richard was a Democrat. Richard was a Democrat and Morris is a Republican, the former chairman of the Republican Party in Arkansas. And the two brothers were of different political persuasions, no doubt about that. They also were, both were very highly educated. And uh, if you went to dinner with them, and uh, th they didn't prefer that you understood what they were talking about, they would converse in Latin with each other. 
and sort of frees you out of the conversation. It's, it's said that when Richard was at Yale, uh, they have a, a, a debate every spring between a student chosen by the student body and a faculty member uh, on a topic of interest. And uh, they tell the story that uh, the faculty member closed his argument by quoting uh, a sentence or two from Cicero. And uh, Richard got up to respond to the argument and used the paragraph verbatim from Cicero, from which the professor had coined, the, uh, had taken the two sentences. So, oh, he was a he was a great guy. And and he and Morris liked to play to the crowd. I mean, maybe it was a sensitivity to brothers being on the court, but they they were they were provided some pretty good entertainment. At they, that. they did, they did, and and that's a situation that will never happen again, because the Congress has now passed a statute which prohibits relatives uh, within the third degree of consanguinity or affinity from serving on the same court. Now this is almost, the story is almost too good to be true with you a lot of times, but this again, we, we turn right from the Morris Arnold becomes brother of Richard Arnold, and then the next court appointment, I think, or one soon after, was another historic appointment. Um, Judge Diana Murphy was appointed. That's correct. And how did that unfold? And uh, tell us a little bit about you and Judge Diana Murphy. Well, <clears throat> Judge Murphy uh, was a distinguished Minnesota jurist. She went to law school rather late in life, uh, and uh, she had served as a, uh, a Minnesota State D uh, District Judge uh, in Hennepin County, Minnesota, uh, was chief judge of that court. She was then appointed a uh, United States District Judge uh, in the District of Minnesota, I believe by President Carter, and uh, uh, served eventually as Chief Judge of that court. And so she came to our court with 15 or 16 years of distinguished service as a trial judge. I, I first met her when I was a freshly minted United States District Judge, and she was a Minnesota uh, State Court Judge. and. Uh, then she became a United States District Judge, and we worked together on committees and uh, developed a, a friendship for each other. Uh, and then she was nominated uh, by President Clinton uh, to come to the Eighth Circuit, and she, and she was confirmed and, and appointed. Uh, she's a brilliant woman. You can, the n number of firsts that she has accomplished in her career would, is as long as your arm. Uh, a, a very distinguished scholar of the law and uh, a very pleasant person to be around. But uh, she's, uh, she's a lot of fun. You and Judge Murphy developed a special relationship for a couple reasons, and come of, some of them she's told me personally. One of them is, she said, the, it starts with, you know, both of us were interested in sentencing, and we both were cutting our teeth on the same rough patches of the law or new patches of the law. That's true. And Judge Murphy went on to serve on a sentencing. Well, she served as chairwoman of the, of the United States Sentencing Commission. So you continued to have that, and she described it also as you came from the sort of the same time. Uh, you were people of your times and you understood each other almost implicitly on things. We did. Uh, I once compared our, our uh, voting records on the court and uh, really wasn't surprised to find uh, how, how close they were together. And I think I had a conversation or I was a party to that conversation when she's, she then mentioned that um, you and her just became fast friends on the court because you really were welcoming her as the first woman, but she also noted that you continued to be who you were and she really enjoyed that. And I don't know if I shared this with you or not, but she went on to tell me and some other young lawyers in attendance of what she meant. And she said, Judge Hansen, for example, treats me as an equal judicial colleague, but he still tips his hat to a lady when she walks down the street past him. And she looked at us and said, that's a lost start, gentlemen, and don't be so quick to be passed on that. Um, do you remember that? Oh, I, I don't remember tipping my hat to her, but uh, I'm an old school guy, Thad, and that, that's, that's just customary. 
Yeah, and she really found that to be something of a, of a bonding point with you. Um, and you had other contemporaries on the court that you grew up with, similar time, similar background, that you also developed strong relationships. That's right. I had uh, John R. Gibson from Kansas City was one that, uh, that I particularly enjoyed. John was a connoisseur of fine wine. He'd go to Europe uh, on vacation in the summertime and buy his wines by the case and have them shipped back to Kansas City. And whenever he invited you to dinner, you better have some clout left on your MasterCard because uh, the wine was going to be expensive. He picked it and you guys split the bill, right? That's right. That's right. And Judge Bowman from Kansas City was a, is today a, a towering intellect of the law. He uh, was educated at NYU in the London School of Economics. Uh, he was dean at Wake Forest and dean at the University of Missouri, Kansas City uh, at the time of his selection for the Eighth Circuit. I think he was mentioned for one of the Supreme Court spots. He I, was. I, he was I, on the short list uh, in the Reagan administration. And then Judge James Loken in Minnesota, uh, who was mentioned earlier, also became a very good friend over time as well. Right. And uh, uh, one of the strongest friendships I've had on the court is with Judge Roger Woolman from South Dakota. Uh, Roger is a former Chief Justice of the, of the uh, South Dakota Supreme Court, educated at South Dakota's law school and took a master's at Harvard. And uh, he is a solid, solid citizen. There's just no, no two but, no two, uh, ifs about it. So very rewarding time in terms of just colleagues that were contemporaries That's of yours. True. But That's you true. also had some some of the uh, more senior members of the court that you really grew to enjoy, like Judge McMillian. Yes. And you want to comment on Judge McMillian? Uh, Judge McMillian was the first black member of our court. We now have uh, Judge uh, Vince uh, Smith, Smith as, a, as a black member of the court. Uh, Judge McMillian, in many ways, in the black community, is what Diana Murphy has been to, to women's rights. He was the first black uh, everything in Missouri. He was the first black appointed to the Missouri Court of Appeals. He, uh, he graduated first in his class from St. Louis Law School. He was the victim of uh, racial discrimination himself. He told me the story. He was the first black circuit judge. That's what a trial judge is called in Missouri. Uh, the first black circuit judge. And he was driving his new convertible down Market Street in St. Louis when he was pulled over by two of St. Louis's finest. And they spread him out, spread eagled on the front of his car, and were rummaging through his uh, trunk and uh, got into his briefcase. And the one officer said, holy cow, we done got us a circuit judge. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Oops. Is right. Now, Judge McMillian, as I recall, and I think you've said many times, very uh, a pleasant, oh, happy, yes. upbeat, positive guy. Uh, very laid back kind of fellow. And pretty funny from the bench. Oh, he was very funny from the bench. He'd, uh, he'd, he'd make some kind he, a lot of people had a tough time figuring out what he was because he wore a yarmulke on his head and it was uh, in African colors and people were trying to figure out if he was Jewish or not. And he, of course he was not. The reason he wore a, a yarmulke was that he sat right under an air conditioning vent and his head got cold. And so he wore a yarmulke in the courtroom. He also had four gold stripes on his robe. And uh, I asked him one time why, why he had that. And he said, well, he said, you'll remember that Chief Justice Rehnquist had three on his. And he said, I figured I'd just outrank him. <laughs> well, you had uh, great colleagues, a great run, but you also a time in the court, most times in the court are like this, but you really had some interesting cases when you We did. It, it was, uh, we were deciding the, the appeals of sentencing guideline cases. Uh, 
1996, the Congress passed the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which opened up local telephone service. It used to be offered only by the Baby Bells. Uh, local telephone service to competitors who could rent the Bell facilities and uh, offer their own uh, telephone service. And so you had a lot of startup companies doing that. And the Bell system companies, of course, filed suit uh, contesting uh, uh, the, the act. And cases were filed and appeals were taken all around the country. But the uh, Judicial Panel on Multidistrict Litigation consolidated all of those cases in the Eighth Circuit. And there were only three of, a, three of us on the Eighth Circuit who didn't own telephone stock. And so we got to be the panel to hear the case. And uh, we, we, uh, we, we issued a preliminary injunction uh, against the government, against the FCC, in that case, and uh, held uh, a hearing then uh, finally uh, on, the, on the merits. Uh, and we, uh, we reversed the FCC, an opinion that I was privileged to write. The caption, if you look in the Federal Reporter, the caption of that case runs about 50 pages, just the caption, the number of cases involved. It went up on appeal to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court gave it two hours of argument oh and then uh, reversed me in part and affirmed me in part. So it was, uh, it, it's probably the, the, the biggest case that I had an opportunity to write. Any others to jump out for you? Um, there's one that I think of because I know I had a... Oh, you, you, you were on a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. If I remember right, it's... A1 contractors versus street. Tribal jurisdiction. Tribal jurisdiction. Came out of either North or South Dakota, I can't remember which, uh, where a company uh, contested whether or not it was amenable to prosecution in a tribal court. And uh, the uh, district court had held that the company was amenable to Indian court jurisdiction. They appealed to the Eighth Circuit and uh, I was on the, f the first panel, uh, on the panel that heard it, and, uh, and, and the majority of the panel agreed with the district court that they were amenable to it, and I dissented from that, and you helped me write that dissent. And uh, a, a motion, or a petition for in-bank review, where the whole Eighth Circuit sits, not just a three-judge panel, was filed and approved and so we heard the case on Bonk, and uh, my view uh, prevailed at, at the in-bank hearing. And so we came back to Chambers, and you had the job of drafting the first crack at the in-bank opinion, uh, which was uh, after we massaged it and worked on it for a while, while we published it uh, to the court, and we got the votes we needed. And then it went to Supreme Court, and if I remember right, we got affirmed, but on a little different ground than, than, we, yeah, than nine, we had relied on. 9-0, and uh, we thought, wow, that's really fantastic, but they tried to take it a little bit narrower so as not to get at the, the bigger issue, which I remember you reminding me at the time, you can comment on this, Indian gaming and gaming as a whole was becoming a bigger deal outside of Las Vegas and the questions then became what's your relationship as you come onto the reservation so that got quite a bit of attention probably more so than we even perceived at the time. I think you're right. Uh, Judge, you had other cases, do you want to cover any of those uh, that you know you stick out to you, any particular sentencing or criminal cases? Well, I had a case called the United States versus Sabri S-A-B-R-I, it came out of Minnesota. Sabri uh, was a, a real estate developer up there who uh, had managed to uh, make an arrangement with a council member for favorable treatment. And the government uh, prosecuted him under the federal uh, bribery statute. And uh, the, the government uh, 
declined to uh, rely on the power of the purse uh, that Congress has uh, to write legislation governing uh, bribery in a situation where federal funds are involved in the local uh, governmental agency. And uh, I took the position in the panel opinion uh, that the, the Congress had every right to uh, say how its federal dollars were going to be handled at the local level and had the, had the right to write a bribery statute prohibiting bribery on those federal funds. Well, uh, that was a position, the, the purse strings position, was that had been eschewed by the government. They, they didn't want to rely on purse strings. But I, I did. I thought it was the strongest argument that could be made. Uh, it was a two-to-one panel decision. Got appealed to, the panel decision got appealed to the Supreme Court and bypassed on bond consideration. And the Supreme Court agreed with me and uh, said that's a correct reading of the statute. So that was a, that was a nice win. Soon after you were appointed to the Eighth Circuit, you also got drafted in to be part of the judicial group that was planning the new courthouse down there, the, I guess, then new courthouse in St. Louis. Uh, tell us about that. that that's correct. I, I was the new guy on the court, and uh, the, the court had always been headquartered in St. Louis, and so the new building would also house the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. and. Uh, we uh, began uh, studying, uh, choosing an architect, and studying plans and the like, and we finally chose uh, HOK, uh, uh, an architecture firm in, in St. Louis. Uh, also, they also did Camden Yards, the baseball field in Baltimore. But uh, the uh, principal architect was a man whose name was Gio Obata, a Japanese-American man. Uh, brilliant architect. He was in his late 70s then. But he, his first work in St. Louis had been the then soaring arches at, at Lambert Field at the airport. But he came up with a design for a 28-story tower that is, uh, that is unique. And uh, it, it was a lot of work. It meant many, many trips to St. Louis to meet with the architects and the GSA. But we came away with a, an award-winning building, and it's, uh, it's, from what my friends down there tell me, it's working very well. Now, is it true that at the time, or is it still is, the largest courthouse in the country? Yes. I, I believe it's still the largest courthouse in square footage in the country. So that was an, it would, would, it would fall in the category of a very large project. It, it, was, it was huge, uh, over $200 million. And I and several other law clerks have recollected about huge plans and drawings that you had spread out on the table. I mean, this was a job that required plenty from you. It, it did. It required a lot of time. Uh, interestingly, uh, uh, on 9-11, we had just occupied that courthouse, and uh, we heard about the uh, towers in New York going down, and the lawyer, some of the lawyers were very edgy about uh, being in, the, in our tower. And so we gave the, uh, uh, the attorneys the option of either a continuance of the argument or they could stay and argue if they wanted to. We were going to hold court, and, uh, and we did. Uh, but the situation wasn't helped at all by one of the major news uh, organizations uh, in their coverage of the, of the fall of the towers said that uh, they were wondering where the next logical uh, target would be, and it would probably be the newest federal courthouse in the country in St. Louis. <laughs> I'm thinking, wait a minute now, don't give them directions here. Uh, but th that courthouse, the, the courthouse the, has the appellate courtrooms on the upper floors. Right. Grand view of St. Louis, but you're up there a ways. Yeah, up, we occupy the top three floors. Uh, the real f fellow who deserves the credit uh, for that courthouse is uh, Judge Edward Philippine from the, uh, from the Eastern District of Missouri. 
uh, Ed Philippine worked his heart out uh, on that courthouse and uh, was a, the principal mover and shaker from the judiciary. That was a, a big project, but it wasn't the only project you got. As, your, as, as a, uh, in addition to your case duties, Chief Judge Arnold also put you to work on law clerk orientation. He did. What did that entail? Well, I had uh, I, I had made a career of, of studying the, the federal sentencing guidelines in some detail, and they don't teach sentencing in law schools, or didn't. I, I think Iowa now does. I think Judge Malloy teaches a sentencing course down there. But uh, we'd hired all these law clerks uh, for the uh, judges on the court, so we had probably 50 law clerks, none of whom had had any uh, training in the uh, federal sentencing guidelines, and we were getting all these appeals from the district court raising guideline issues and the clerks were having to take a cut at something they, they knew nothing about. So I offered uh, to take them uh, for an afternoon and walk them through a case, a hypothetical case, so they could see how the guidelines would be applied and at least learn the terminology involved because it was a whole new language. I enjoyed, I enjoy teaching, I really do. Yeah, and the guidelines at that time were, were, I don't know if they still are, but that was a big percentage of the cases. Right. There were some questions about whether they were mandatory or discretionary, and there was, there was tension there, so that became very much a focal point of litigation. Each one of these new terms had to be, had to be defined and, and applied uniformly across the circuit. Now, did you notice the, a change in the type or composition of cases you got in your time on the circuit? Well. Not really. We still got our Social Security appeals. We still had a lot of federal and state habeas corpus cases, uh, direct criminal appeals, a lot of administrative law, uh, the EPA, uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, some antitrust work. Uh, it, it, it was about uh, anything that federal law would control, we'd have a case on it. Now, in addition to changes in the law that were occurring during your time, the changes to the criminal law and the guidelines and the sentencing and whatnot, we were going through a change in the everyday operations of the court at the same time, kind of moving to a different age from the paper age to the digital age. You want to comment on what that entailed for you? Well, it, it entailed uh, that the judges uh, m most of them, I can't say all of them, became quite computer literate. Not illiterate, but literate. And uh, we had to staff up and create an IT department uh, at the circuit level. And eventually it became uh, electronic filing and everything became as paperless as it could be. Uh, that started in the district court. Uh, I remember I, I, uh, I wanted to know what I could expect of my legal assist or my judicial assistant, Janice Evans McVeigh, who has been with me f for my whole federal career. I wanted to know what I could expect out of her. And, uh, and so I went out to Kirkwood Community College and took the basic course in word processing and learned word perfect. I think it was then 5.0 or something, and uh, came back and, and had a better understanding of what Janice was having having to do. So, in the way the court communicated then, it was much more by email and oh, yeah. and uh, the 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 court has gone largely to a less paper-based system. That's true. Briefs and whatnot come on in all shapes and sizes, but we still straddle in the divide a little yeah, bit. We. Uh, we got to the point where we loaded uh, the briefs on, uh, on iPads and, and we're able to, instead of carrying heavy briefcases full of briefs to read, you, you read them on the screen. That's kind of how I got my job as a law clerk. I showed that I could carry heavy briefcases. <laughs> uh, good thing it wasn't in this day and age. What he hasn't told you is that he made his living as an undergraduate, as a mover of furniture. Right, so I was the perfect briefcase carrier, right off the bat.
Now you served in uh, lots of different functions we covered on the court, but you also got a year as chief judge on the court. I did. How did that come about? Well, uh, the chief judgeship is, is not an elected position. It's, uh, it's one that is uh, occupied by the judge who's under 65 and who has the oldest commission date, uh, senior judge in time of service. Well, uh, Judge Arnold uh, was uh, appointed chief judge in 92, and uh, along about uh, 98, he decided that he wouldn't serve out his full seven-year term. Uh, I told you that there were several judges who were appointed right together in time, close in time. And so he proposed that he step down as chief judge and that Judge Pasco Bowman take the position for a short period of time and then it would go to the next in line who was Judge Roger Woolman. And uh, that occurred and, and Judge Bowman served uh, for a year and then took senior status and Judge Woolman then became the chief judge and he likewise did not serve out uh, a full term. He gave up his seat early. Judge Fagg, my friend and fellow Iowan, uh, declined to serve as chief judge. He was going to be the next in line. He declined to serve and so the next in line would have been Judge Loken from Minnesota. But I was sitting down here and would never be chief judge because of the age limitations. And so Woolman and Loken agreed that Loken would step out of line and I would become chief judge. And when I qualified for senior status, I would give up the chief judgeship and Loken would then get back in line and, and take it for a full seven year term. So I was able through the uh, courtesy and, and uh, collegiality of my brethren uh, to serve as chief judge of the court for 14 months. And, and you described that process to me once as put in, I think other judges have too, put in motion by Richard Arnold and sort of right. in, in his shadow very much. That's right. And uh, I think I told you once that I got a compliment to pass along to you from the uh, clerk of court who said you were a chief judge in the model of Richard, Richard Arnold. Well, I, I consider that a high compliment. And I, and I think that's uh, exactly how it was meant. And um, uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting story, and it goes to the collegiality business, that's too. exactly right. Yeah. All right. Did you enjoy being chief judge? Yes. Uh, I had to put the uh, new ink in my fax machine every other day. But uh, other than that, why, it, was, it was fun. A uh, lot of extra work, not a lot of extra pay. Good. <laughs> But you do have uh, some good duties and you can make your imprint on that court. Um, I, I mean, I can't believe I'm saying this again, but it might surprise people to know that that's not even the end of your non Eighth Circuit case related duties. You got tapped for a couple other things when you were on the court, right? I did. The Chief Justice uh, found out that you might be a good person to serve on a national committee. Why don't you tell me what, what he had you do there? Well, uh as a district judge, first of all, you need to understand, and I'm sure you do, how the judiciary governs itself. The, the uh, policy-making body for the judiciary, uh, first is the Congress, but within the judiciary itself is uh, an organization called the Judicial Conference of the United States. It's made up of the chief circuit judges from around the country and one district judge from each circuit who is elected by the district judges of the district of the districts uh, together with the uh, the chief of the uh, court of international trade and the chief of the court of claims and uh, it's chaired by the chief justice of the united states the conference operates by a committee system and one of the principal committees is called the Committee on the Judicial Branch. And it's charged with the judiciary's relationship with Congress, including the care and feeding of federal judges. 
And uh, in 1991, Chief Justice Rehnquist appointed me to that committee. In 97, he made me the chairman of the committee, and I served until 2001. I served a four-year chairmanship. Uh, that was uh, exhilarating work. Uh, of course, I, I had already worked in the Congress and worked for a congressman and uh, knew a senator. Uh, new two senators, and so uh, the idea of coordinating came pretty easy to me, and it was it was cutting edge stuff and uh, very very enjoyable work. Uh, the committee met at various locations around the country, and uh, so it involved some travel opportunities as well. Uh, when I finished that duty on the judicial branch committee. Uh, the Chief Justice asked me if I would serve on the uh, Judicial Panel on Multi-District Litigation, and I agreed. It was a seven-year appointment. Uh, that particular panel is statutory in origin, and it is charged with uh, surveying the country. For instance, uh, the Toyota automobile uh, litigation that arose three or four years ago. Uh, there were lawsuits filed all over the country concerning that case. And uh, the purpose of the Judicial Panel uh, on Multi-District lit Litigation, called the MDL Panel, uh, is to consolidate all of those cases together before a single district judge for pretrial purposes, for all the discovery. Same thing happened with all the cases arising out of the, uh, the, the uh, oil well uh, fiasco in the Gulf. Uh, all the states were suing, individuals were suing, fishermen were suing, oystermen were suing, motel owners were suing. Uh, and all those cases were consolidated uh, before a judge in, uh, in Louisiana uh, by the MDL panel. And the MDL panel would meet uh, every other month and had roughly anywhere from 40 to 60 items on its docket to decide where and before which judge these, these multi-district cases should be consolidated. That was fun. That was, again, cutting edge stuff because it was right out of the newspapers when you saw a, uh, a, a stock on Wall Street take an, an unusual dip. You knew the next day that uh, you'd have multi-district cases filed around the country that needed to be uh, worked and uh, needed to be consolidated. Now, I know from uh, just my brief time in the federal judiciary that those are uh, particularly prestigious assignments you get, um, but they, they were really demanding time -wise. They were. Uh, they were. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what some of that work entailed? I know a little bit from coming on board when there were still issues about a pay raise and lots of things that required lots and lots of time and energy. You want to give us a little sample? Well, uh, they did. It, it, uh, for the MDL work, you had to immerse yourself in the, in the individual cases to see whether or not they shared enough uh, uh, similarities that uh, consolidating them would make sense. Uh, the, the panel is blessed uh, with, a, with a very good, a small but very good staff, and they, they did a lot of the legwork for us, but it, it still meant a huge amount of reading to get ready for the sessions that we held around the country. On the uh, uh, Judicial Branch Committee, uh, it was highly, uh, highly political. Uh, relationships with the Congress are political, and that's what our business was. So we had to work closely with the chairs of the respective judiciary committees and uh, uh, try to keep uh, everybody happy. Uh, the budget committee took care of the appropriations, thank God. We didn't have to get immersed in all of that. But uh, it, it took a lot of time, and, and uh, it's, all, it's all part of the duty. Uh, you don't get extra pay for it at all. You just expected to, to do that along with your regular court work. 
and and that's what you do. You took you some interesting places: the Capitol, the White House, uh, among yeah. others. I, I've got to tell you one story. I was chair of the Judicial Branch Committee, and uh, we thought the judges deserved a pay raise. This is during the Clinton administration. And so we arranged to have an appointment in the White House with John Podesta, who was President Clinton's chief of staff. He, he now runs Hillary Clinton's campaign. Uh, and so there were three or four of us uh, who went to see Mr. Podesta. And uh, he met us in his office, which is right next to the president's. It has a, had a lovely fireplace, but it was, it was actually smaller than this room is. And uh, he had a conference table, something like this, where we all sat down. I sat down and uh, moved my chair up, moved my feet up, and I felt something on my right foot. I ran into something. And I didn't know what it was, so I looked down, and my right toe of my shoe had become stuck in one of these square glue mouse traps. And I couldn't get away from the mouse trap. And so uh, I took out my pen, ostensibly making some notes about it, and I dropped my pen. And I reached down to get my pen, uh, really to get my shoe out of the glue. And before that, I took my other foot, trying to free my right foot, and I had both of them stuck in the, in the mouse trap. And so I reached down to pick up ostensibly to pick up my pen, and I finally got my shoes disengaged from the mousetrap, but I had that glue stuff all over my hands. And we finished our conference and got ready to leave, and everybody was shaking hands all the way around, and I, I stood like this, thanking <laughs> Mr. Podesta with my hands behind my back, and I bet he thought I was the most discourteous person he'd ever met. But, uh, and we didn't get a pay raise. <laughs> or maybe that was part of the White House strategy to discourage people from staying long. I don't, get I don't know, but oh, it, was a, something else. it was a funny, funny thing. Uh, we got out in the car afterwards, and one of your colleagues, a uh, bankruptcy judge from Arkansas, a woman whose name I can't recall right now, uh, I was saying, did you, did you guys see what I got into? And she said, yes, I did. <laughs> well, I interesting experiences all the way around in terms of the case-related work and the work related to non-case-related items or multi-district litigation. We can safely say that as we transition to the next subject, which is the chamber staff and your relationship with staff um, and you had already said you, you became kind of family but I'd like you to comment a little bit more on that. You had a particularly long relationship with your judicial assistant Janice McVeigh. That's right. That's right. She, in, if she had been born 10 years later she would have been a lawyer today. A very bright woman, uh, capable of a huge amount of work. And uh, she, she was really the chief of staff and, and ran, kept the office running for me so I could devote my time to the business of judging. And uh, she, she retired recently after, what, 30 years in uh, federal service. You two sort of turned out the lights together, is, is that right? That's right, we did. Well, although she continued to work for Judge Kilberg for a couple of years after I, I, I ceased working. Yeah, and that relationship where, where Janice was then, for us as law clerks, uh, uh, an important... She was a mother, a mother hen. Right, and, and, and very much so. But she also instilled in us then the idea that we were all part of the family. That's right. And that's how you wanted it. I, I tried to involve my clerks in every facet of my work as a circuit judge. 
Some judges only use their law clerks on the argued cases and handle the non-argued cases and the administrative cases uh, by themselves. I, I made my law clerks get involved in the screening panel cases and the administrative panel cases, as well as the, uh, uh, the, the workings of the court uh, and, the, uh, and the argued cases. So we're talking about Janice McVeigh and her relationship with us as kind of a mother of the, the, the ship, so to speak, in really instilling a sense of family and uh, a sense of a mission to us, I guess. And that's really what you wanted. That, that's right. Uh, the clerks are very important to a judge. They have to be carefully chosen and they need to be educated as well. And part of that education is their relationship with the judge. And Janice did a good job of preparing a law clerk manual, uh, which we gave to each uh, arriving law clerk, describing how chambers functioned and the part that the clerk was to play in that functioning. And we really uh, get a sense of working as a team that came from Janice, but also from you sitting down with us from the word go and describing your vision of a more complete experience for us. Uh, for example, I'll just have you comment on this. We were told about each individual member of the court in some detail early in our experience to help us, I think, understand our role in the court. But you tell us why you, you gave us that overview of each member. Well, I wanted, I wanted you to know the background of the author of the opinion so that you would have some idea where that author was coming from and would know if we, if we were going to respond to him or her with other than uh, and I'm, that I'm pleased to concur in your proposed opinion, I wanted to be sure that we didn't unnecessarily offend the writer. Uh, it was very important to me that, uh, that when I had to disagree with my colleagues, that I did so in the most respectful way I, I could. Uh, I closed my dissents with, I respectfully dissent, not I dissent. Uh, and uh, I, I, I tried hard to, uh, we, we, we rarely referred to each other by first names. It was, it was always Judge Bowman or Judge Woolman. It wasn't Woolman or Bowman. We tried to, try to keep that, uh, that balance going. And uh, were you aware that that was not exactly how it went in everybody else's chambers? Uh, I, I, I did not know. I, it worked for me, and that was all I was interested in. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience for us, and I think it certainly helped in the way that we perceived the court and understood the court, um, which kind of leads into the next part of the law clerk story is that a number of these law clerks have gone on to really good careers, in, both in the practice and on the bench. Um, I guess maybe we'll just highlight the members that have made the bench, since it's a judicial interview, uh, but I, I, I think we'd be remiss not to note that you've had and still have a number of outstanding practitioners out there that are really at the top of the field. Um, but you've produced a fair number of judges from your law clerk uh, litters, right? Well, they've, they've done it on their own, and it's, it's their merit that gets them their appointments. Yes, you're, you're right. Uh, Jane Kelly now sits on the Court of Appeals, the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. Uh, Matt Johnson sits on the Minnesota Court of Appeals and just finished a seven-year term as chief judge of that court. Sam Thumma uh, sits on the Court of Appeals in Arizona. He was a candidate for an opening on the Arizona Supreme Court recently. The governor, the, he made it to the governor's office, but the governor did not select him. But he, I, I just wrote a letter for him last week. Um, he's out after the next opening, which is coming up. Uh, Rustin Davenport it, it was my first federal law clerk, and he's now an Iowa district judge in uh, Mason City. Uh, um, Christopher McDonald sits on the Iowa Court of Appeals. Uh, 
He was an Iowa district judge and recently was appointed to the Iowa Court of Appeals. Uh, John Bodenhausen is a United States uh, magistrate judge in the Eastern District of Missouri, a former assistant United States attorney down there. And you, as a uh, chief judge of the uh, United States Bankruptcy Court for the Northern District of Iowa. So I've had seven, I think, of my clerks who have become judicial officers in their own right. Uh, and I'll just note with uh, quite a bit of help from uh, coming from very good stock, so to speak. Um, do you want to make a special comment on Judge Kelly, the fact that she clerked for you and now is an active judge on the Eighth Circuit? Uh, how does that make you feel or do you have any reaction to that? Oh, it makes me very proud of Jane. I, uh, she's a, a brilliant, brilliant intellect. She'll do a great job on the Eighth Circuit. And I was particularly pleased that she was one of the uh, final five that President Obama looked at. Uh, it's, it's a little disconcerting to look up and see Jane sitting there, but she's earned it. Uh, would you agree with me that she's one of those people where you go, this is where a case where the, the nice one or the good one actually finishes first here? Uh, she's the real deal. Um, do you have any advice for aspiring judges or judges that are sitting on the bench about things we should maybe strive for or think about? Well, you can't worry about what the appellate court might think. You've got to decide the case the way you think it should be decided. You've got to take into consideration all the evidence and the arguments that have been made. Uh, as a trial judge, it's a lonely occupation. Uh, as an appellate judge, you at least have a little support from at least one other colleague when you're on a three-judge panel. Uh, take, as Richard always used to say, it takes two to make a court. And, uh, but you, you work hard, you study, you stay current. Uh, you don't get uh, uh, all hung up on yourself. And you realize that the principal thing I would tell them is that you need to remember that judges are appointed and not anointed. And I think if you approach the job with, with that in mind, you'll do all right. I think you used to tell me to don't ever forget what it was like to practice law and the pressures of being in the practice. That's right. And that's, right. that's who you're serving and they're not serving you. Uh, the other thing uh, that was attributed to you by one of our colleagues, I'll let you comment on whether that was an original or if it was something that uh, you got somewhere else, but you said, and I believe Judge Bennett is quoted as saying, Judge Hansen reminds us that each time we go on court, we have the chance to do justice, but we also run the risk of doing injustice, and that's right. something we need to guard against. And the line between justice and injustice in a particular case is often thin and not easily discernible. Uh, but it's the judge's job to make the call. It's the judge's job to decide the case. Uh, don't wring your hands over it. Get it done. Get it out. Let's let the appellate judges worry about it from that point on. Now, if we could move away a little bit from uh, judging and maybe to a little bit of the backdrop of your life during the time that uh, you were a judge. You did some other things as well. You taught at Cornell College for a little while. You want to tell us about that? Uh, yes, I enjoyed that very much. Uh, I took their, uh, I team taught the course. It was entitled uh, Current Cases Before the Supreme Court. And I took their juniors and seniors who thought they wanted to go to law school and we took 15 cases on the court's current calendar and studied them in depth. We divided the class into uh, two-person argument teams and assigned each team a case to argue. We took, uh, we got the briefs from the Supreme Court and uh, we took over the uh, city council chambers in Mount Vernon and turned it into an appellate courtroom and they had to argue one case, and they had to sit as an associate justice of the court on another case, and they were graded on both performances. And their paper for the course was they had to write the opinion 
they thought the Supreme Court would write in the case that they argued. If they thought they had the losing side of the argument, they could they could write accordingly. They didn't, they weren't stuck with the case the side that was assigned to them. Uh, I taught the course uh, very Socratically, uh, as I remembered my law school classes being taught 53 years ago. Uh, students stood to recite. The gentlemen were required to wear a coat and tie, and the, the uh, ladies had to wear uh, pantsuits or dresses, and uh, everyone was referred to by Mr. or Miss. Uh, no ball caps were allowed, and uh, we'd, we'd, I tried to replicate the kind of decorum that they could expect as lawyers to find in courtrooms around the country. Uh, We've had several students in those courses uh, go on to law school and uh, and do very well. Uh, it was fun. It was entertaining. It was engaging. Uh, the students were uniformly bright. And uh, Dr. Sutherland, uh, Robert Sutherland, with whom I taught the course, uh, took care of the political side of, of, of the cases. He's a professor, a retired professor of politics at Cornell. And I took care of the legal, legal side of it, and uh, we we had a great time with it. Now the college really liked what you did for them, uh, and they bestowed a, quite a nice honor on you. You want to tell us about that? The board of trustees of Cornell were kind enough to, to uh, award me an honorary doctorate of laws. And that was quite a ceremony. I was there, and several of your colleagues from the court, I remember Judge Bowman and Judge Loken for sure were there, and it was a really, really wonderful ceremony. It was a, it was a good day. The college choir sang, and I had, uh, years before, uh, the college opened the choir to members of the community, and I had sung with that college choir for about three or four years. I'm glad you brought that up because you did also sing in the church choir too. In addition to uh, your weekly duties, you would go off for choir practice. Yeah. And sometimes, every now and then, your job duties intersected with your choir practice. Sure did. I remember one night um, I was at choir practice and uh, Ginger was uh, waiting for me and the telephone rang in the church office. And she answered it and, and uh, the inquiry was for me. She said, well, he's busy right now. And it was Michael Gans, and uh, the clerk of the search of court. And uh, he said, well, I need to talk to him right away. Right away, it's a death penalty case. And so I was called to the phone, and I talked with Mr. Gans and cast my vote, and then uh, went back to choir practice singing the Lord's praises. <laughs> Quite an interesting and uh, real dichotomy. Yeah, dichotomy there. You, you brought up Michael Gans, who is the uh, clerk of the Eighth Circuit, still is the clerk of the Eighth Circuit. Long but during time, your long time clerk, long time during the time you were chief judge and as a, serving as a judge, you developed a pretty good relationship with Michael over the years. You bet. He is, in, in my view, the preeminent circuit court clerk in the country. Yeah. Um, I think I've told you this before too, but he might say something like back at you in your role as judge, but you really, you you two really hit it off even starting from the building project, as That's I right. recall it. That's right. We were both both intimately involved in that building. And then you continued to be involved in projects together throughout your time on the court. That's true. And you continue to be involved with other things in the court and other offices like the circuit executive. That's one that maybe people that aren't on the court don't know us quite as much about. The current circuit executive, and she's been the executive for some time, is Millie Adams. And it's her job to take care of the housekeeping operations of the court. Uh, space and facilities, uh, support in, in the printing, all sorts of, uh, of, of necessary items that need to be acquired for the court. Uh, she manages the uh, information technology staff and uh, takes care of all the budgeting. It's a, it's a big time job. 
And you should know that uh, when, when I see Michael Gans or Millie Adams, uh, I'm always received well as being part of the Hanson family. Um, and I, I understand you consider them to be sort of part of your extended yeah. family of clerks and office and everything. They serve me very well. Now, I've been saving this one for towards the end, and we're getting near wrapping up here, but we talk about legacy items. I know you're not real big on legacy items, and you're a very humble guy, but you've had opinions, you've helped build buildings, you've helped do all this sort of stuff uh, in, in the judiciary that's really been phenomenal, and even in your practice, you really have had a, quite an experience. Do you have any particular items you like, would like to point to as legacy pieces, or how do you react to that? I think the best thing that can be said about a judge is that whether appellate or trial, that he was an able judge. And so, if I am to be remembered, I would like to be remembered as he was an able judge. Well, I think you're pretty safe on that one. I think you're pretty safe. Well, let's talk about another item that I consider a legacy item for you, and that's this very building we're sitting in. Uh, you and Judge Malloy, we talked about that way back at the beginning, about how that got going and ended up in this building. But that was really a long, long process. In addition to everything else you were doing, you were still keeping your fingers in the Northern District of Iowa. That's true, uh, and we have this building because of the flood in 2008. We were always getting bumped further down on the list of projects that the administrative office of the United States Court would promote to the Congress. And uh, when the flood came and flooded out 101 First Street Southeast, uh, we got declared a judicial emergency, and we went to the top of the list. We had the plans on the shelf. We were, I guess the current term is shovel ready. And uh, Senator Harkin was sitting on the Senate Appropriations Committee in an elevated position. And uh, he had an assistant working for him whose name is Richard Bender, who was his appropriations guy. And between Senator Harkin and Richard Bender, we got the money on an emergency basis to build this courthouse. And we went to the top of the list, much to the chagrin of eight or other ten cities around the nation who thought they were in line for construction money. But it's through the work of Senator Harkin, Senator Grassley, and Richard Bender that we have this, this beautiful building. Now, I, I know you're uh, a humble guy and you want to deflect some of uh, your responsibility for it, but I sometimes tongue-in-cheek refer to it as the house that Hanson and Malloy built, but uh, we have a wonderful building and it's a modern building and it's a statement building. Can you tell us a little bit about how the design came to be and what things you wanted to see in it and what things that uh, you know others wanted to see in it? Well, uh, the architect chosen for this building is William Rawn, R-A-W-N, from Boston. Uh, Bill Rahn is a very interesting person. He uh, graduated from Harvard Law School. He was a classmate of Attorney General Tom Miller. And uh, he went to work for a uh, D.C. law firm for five or six years and grew tired of document discovery. and. And so uh, he decided he wanted to be an educational administrator. And so he signed on as the uh, chancellor at the uh, University of Massachusetts in Boston. And uh, after six or seven years, he grew restless and uh, decided that architecture was his real love. And so he went back and got a master's degree in architecture from MIT and hung out his shingle as a solo architect in Boston. At the time he designed this building, uh, his office had about 65 people working in it. He's known for the use of glass. He likes to use a lot of glass, and that fit us very well because we wanted a lot of natural light, we wanted transparency. We wanted the people going by to be able to look in and see uh, the, the entrance to the courtrooms. Uh, and, and Bill Ron accomplished all of that. In 2009, 
he was selected as Architecture Magazine's Architect of the Year. He has done work also uh, for Grinnell College uh, in, in Grinnell. In fact, I recently had a conversation with the new president of Cornell College in Mount Vernon, uh, and uh, one thing we had in common is we both knew Bill Ron because uh, President Brand had, uh, had been a, a, a provost, I think, at Grinnell when Ron did some residential buildings for Grinnell. But it was, a, it was a collaborative effort on design. We went through three or four different preliminary designs until we settled on the one that we're in. Uh, I, I, I wanted columns for the courthouse. I didn't think you could have a courthouse without columns. And so the columns that you see outside the, the front here were uh, Ron's attempt to give me columns. And the first ones he designed uh, looked like noodles. They, they, they were spindly. They weren't had any. They didn't have any body to them. And I raised a little cane about that, and he he came back with more substantial columns. And I, I think they they fit the edifice very well. Yeah, I I remember him telling me when I entered the project that Judge Hanson's prints are all over this as well in terms of a design, so anything that uh, people ooh and ah about ought to include that because there were some hard-fought battles that ended up producing, I think, a true collaboration with what we wanted and what they wanted, and we ended up with a vision of something I think we're all very happy with. Good. Now, um, I want you to comment on this, and then I'll follow up with it, but one of the construction superintendents said, uh, as we neared uh, the end of the building process and you were nearing retirement, he joked that, uh, you know, Judge Hanson has been involved in these two magnificent buildings. He had to hang out his shingle as a construction manager there in his retirement days. Uh, and then he said, you know, I'm only partially joking, because very few people have had an experience like that. Uh, your thoughts on being involved as a construction manager on a couple big buildings when you came out as a law guy and, and never had any construction kind of thing in your future? Well, I grew up in a, in a small town lumberyard, and I've, I've always enjoyed carpentry work. And so I, I actually enjoyed all this extra duty of, of helping frame a, a courthouse. Uh, uh, I don't plan to go into the construction supervision business at all. I'm enjoying uh, living on our farm with Mary Virginia and uh, doing what I want to do when I want to do it. Well, that gets me to the, my final questions here. The, uh, since I haven't seen the Hanson construction manager ads and you're, you're not inclined to do that, what, tell us what you do do with uh, retirement time. Oh, there's always work to do around the farm. There's always fence to be fixed, uh, buildings to be painted. Uh, there's always a honey-do list hanging in the kitchen. Uh, it, there's just uh, uh, no, no want of work. All right, any areas we failed to cover today? Well, I want to tell you one story about a trial experience that I had. Because I think it, it talks to the, uh, or speaks to the uh, ingenuity of uh, Iowa lawyers, Iowa practitioners, even in the heat of a trial. Uh, in the Waterloo murder case, we were over in Dubuque picking a jury, and we were picking a jury in panels of seven so we didn't pollute the whole veneer if somebody made a misstatement. And we'd, we were in the third day of picking a jury, and I'd listened to the lawyers' voir dire questions through several panels. And uh, all of a sudden, one of the lawyers uh, interrogating a potential jury person said, uh, let's assume that you and I are in Singapore and we see two rickshaws collide. And with that, there was a bunch of activity down at council that I really could, didn't understand and couldn't see what was happening. And uh, he goes on to question the uh, jury person that we, we may have seen these two rickshaws collide from two different angles. 
Each of us have a different story to tell, but each of us is telling the truth, what we saw. Well, we take an afternoon break, and I, back in chambers, and I say to my court reporter, what was all that uh, action at council table? And uh, her name was Brenda Ellison. And Brenda said, uh, I'm not supposed to tell you. And I said, you will tell me. <laughs> she said, well, the lawyers had a bet that whoever could introduce the words Rick Shaw into the record got five bucks from everybody else. <laughs> And, and the defense counsel won the f five bucks from everybody, and they were collecting it down there. And I just went through the room. I was ready to hold a hearing and really uh, give a lecture. And she said, uh, the next word is xylophone, and it's worth $20. <laughs> so I went back in the courtroom and I waited for the lawyers to get into a real jangle, and I was going to say, gentlemen, I'm tired of hearing these tones from an out-of-tune xylophone. Pay me. <laughs> <laughs> but I never got the chance. It didn't work. It didn't work. Well, Judge, do you have any final comments or a benediction of sorts you'd like to leave us with? Oh, I tell you, it has been uh, a rare privilege and, a, and an unearned honor for me to, to be able to serve the people of my state and my nation as a judicial officer. I've had a wonderful career. I've enjoyed it. It's been fun. It's been hard work. But I hope that I've made some contribution to the advancement of the law as a method of continuing to solve human disputes and human arguments in a just way. Well, thank you, Judge Hanson. On behalf of the lawyers, the judges, and the public, you've served so grandly over your tremendous career. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.